Hello everyone and welcome to the show. My name is Apostol Adin, and the purpose of today's live stream is to have believers, uh, namely Muslims, call in and talk to me about their questions and doubts. Uh, this is not really a space or the kind of platform for me to tell them what to think about their thoughts and their doubts, but it's rather to give them a chance to talk about them openly. Because I know that from my time as a believer and from everything that I've been hearing, it is very difficult to talk about the questions that you have about the religion of Islam, unfortunately. So this is my attempt to give them a space to do so um, in a hopefully comfortable way. And we already have people who would like to join today's live stream. If you would like to join today's live stream, the link is pinned to the live chat. So if you want to join as a caller, feel free to go, go through the steps right now and join the queue. We already have one caller who would like to join. And we have a Muslim woman who wasn't able to join herself. And she sent me messages to read on her behalf. So I'm going to do that as well, uh, maybe towards the end of the live stream. For the time being, I'm taking callers, and it seems like uh, a lot of people are here on time, and I really appreciate that. Let me see. Can we even see the comments on... Can everyone see the comments on screen? Okay, so it seems like I might have broken that feature somehow. Anyway, also, I'm excited to announce I have implemented a voice changer feature. So if you would like your voice changed as a caller uh, for security reasons or for privacy reasons, feel free to let me know before uh, I add you. So when you're talking to the moderators before you join the queue, let them know that you would like your voice changed. We're trying that feature out today. So hopefully it makes people feel more comfortable to join if that was a concern for them before. So... It seems like we have one caller who's ready to join, so I hope you're ready, because I'm adding you to the live stream now. Hey, embezzlement, can you hear me? You are muted at the moment. Hello? Let's see Hi. if the audio catches up. Hey. How's it going? You're welcome. I'm doing well, thanks uh, for asking. So, um, so yeah. tell me a little bit about yourself and why you'd like to join today. That is for questioning Muslims, but I've only been an ex-Muslim for about like two weeks now. So like, I wouldn't say like I'm that fully, like, you know, like dedicated to the title yet, but I still have like my doubts on whether or not like I'm making the right decision or not. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. So what are these yes. doubts? And you, you say you've only been um, an ex-Muslim so for a couple of weeks. It has started. What got um, you to that point to, to begin with? I was just watching some things. I'm like, people were just dying left and right. And I was just like, there's no way people can just like die like that without knowing anything about Islam or like they didn't even get the chance to become Muslim. So like they're going to go to hell because they were sinning and stuff like that my mind at the time. So I got to praying and I got to making dua and I got to making tahajjud like during the nights during Ramadan begging and pleading to God like if I'm following Islam well like show me the right way to Islam. And I had gotten into like Salafi Sal Salafia I think. It was Salafia, and then it wasn't making sense. So I was looking at Shia, Ahmadiyya, and Sufi, and all those stuff. And nothing was making any sense. So when I got to actually reading the Quran myself and reading the Hadith and, you know, all of that, it just didn't feel as empowering as it was when I was blinded by, like, the so-called beauty of Islam. Does that make sense? And it was just like... I don't feel safe anymore, like mm -hmm. mentally and physically, I don't feel like this so-called diamond that Islam or like, you know, like the sheikhs like to make us seem. Of course. The sheikhs like to make us feel like we are lucky to be Muslim, right? So do you feel, or did you feel to lucky honest, to be a no. Muslim when you were having because these I think questions and doubts? I was told to start wearing the hijab. 
it just it left a bad taste in my mouth because I was specifically told like a month after I had got my period. I was like twelve years old. Oh uh, no, yeah, a month after I got my period, they're like, "You're older now. You have to start wearing it, or else I'm not going to the hellfire because of you." Basically, I'm like, "Oh, well, I don't want you to go to hell. I'll wear it. Like, I'll put it on." So, like, just that alone, just being like watching other girls be able to show their hair and do their hair and braid it and whatnot and being excluded from that type of you know stuff like that it really did not make me feel good but there's many like other factors too and it's not just like you know that aspect of it just the aspect of just like wanting to be free basically so I felt very very like I don't know like I have no freedom I hope that makes sense. It does. Yeah, it's fine. I mean, I'm, I'm still sorry going you went through, through that. Um, There's really nothing a lot of us can do, especially as women, because the whole religion is really focused on us not being like, um, promiscuous or like any of that so yeah sorry bear with me for a second there's some issue okay. with your audio that i will fix um sorry give me a moment that's fine now, I think now our audio should be synced. Um, I, I was listening to you, but I was also trying to diagnose the problem at the same time. Oh, so, yeah, okay, we, sh we should be in sync now. Um, you said that you have only been an ex-Muslim for two weeks, and you're having doubts about that, I'm assuming, right? Right. So what makes you doubt that? What makes you doubt that Islam is not true? What, what makes me, okay, so first of all, what makes me doubt being an ex-Muslim is the thought of hellfire. And I feel like Muslims and growing up as, you know, like, growing up as a Muslim, you are constantly bombarded with the idea of hellfire. Like, heaven is, like, barely discussed. You were always told about sinning, and going to the hellfire, and that's my, and that's a big fear of mine. I'm still trying to minimize it, but it pops up here and there where what if, you know, maybe, you know, maybe I am like, you know, being influenced by the West or maybe Islam is the way and I'm just, you know, I, I just want to do whatever the hell I want to do. And then when I read, then when I go back to the Hadith and I look at, look at it, I'm like, yeah, no, I don't. I, yeah, this is a woman's rights, no matter how you try to twist and turn it. It just, it's its not a religion for women, if that makes sense. Well, let's, uh, let's try to unpack why you have that fear of hell, or let's think about it this way. Could it be possible that Islam is true and it's just cruel to women? Would it be possible? No, I don't think so. Why not? I don't think so. It just logically just doesn't make any sense. Like, we see if Islam promotes, okay, so when, you know, people, you know, when the Muslims watch people like Mufti Mank or Umar Suleiman, all they do is talk about how, you know, you should treat women with kindness, talk to her kindly. But when you watch some of the, you know, the Salafi, uh, the Salafi um, sheikhs or whatnot, you know, they, they do sort of promote abusing women and 
you know, her rights and like things like, I think one of the shirts that I watched, she said, if your husband tells you you can't even go see your mother, you can't see your mother. Like these are things that can mentally, you know, uh, hurt a woman or even like, you know, with the abuse thing, you're physically hurting a woman. So it's like, you're still, it's not, it's not as peaceful as it's supposed to be when if like, if you promote something like that, you should stand on it and do it, but you can't have like, you know, like things that contradict exactly what you're trying to promote then like, I don't know. I feel like I'm talking in circles. I, I, I'm trying to get my thoughts together. But I think, I think that's exactly what I mean. Yeah, I, I think I, I understand what you mean. I mean, that could be one way to comfort yourself when you're thinking about, could it be true all the um, accusations that Islam and some believers level at ex-Muslims that you left because of so-and-so if, if you ever start thinking that way, start thinking, then what is the alternative? Let's finish that thought to its to its conclusion. If that is true, then the conclusion is that Islam is just very horribly sexist and that's and that's the way Allah wants it. And that doesn't seem to be a conclusion that makes sense to you, right? Right. So there's no other option except that at least you can dismiss those uh, concerns that that Islam is true. I don't know if yeah. I'm helping or not. We're also kind of talking in circles, but yeah. Um, no, it definitely makes sense. I was having a conversation with someone about this, and they're still a Muslim, but what they've come to terms is women one way or the other need to be controlled by men and I just feel as though, like, okay, especially with, like, evolution or, like, how humans, like, evolve. We could have evolved in so many different ways, but we chose, you know, the one that stuck was men being in power and women being subjugated. But I just feel as though, like, in some other alternate universe or in another dimension, you know, maybe women are in power and men are the ones who are subjugated. Or... You know, there's another dimension where both of them are like, you know, uh, all of us are um, seen as equals. So I just feel as though, like, I don't know, like, just this one way, because we see that men and women are able to coincide with one another and live together without all of those, like, you know, like restrictions or whatnot, especially within the West. I mean, yes, do things still happen, of course, but. You know, as we progress, I feel like we're doing better in a way. Does that make sense? As what, as time progresses, women are doing better? No, men, men are able to, how do I say this? I'm sorry. That's okay. There are men who respect women and their boundaries and won't overstep that not for any like like let's say like there are men out there who think that a woman's body belongs to him because she's a woman right there are men nowadays who are realizing that that type of ideology is very wrong so like you know they're able to befriend women without like expecting her to do anything like you know for him or whatnot and that's what i mean like we're progressing in a way where you know we can respect respect each other as human beings and not look at each other as oh like you know one is better than the other or one should be below the other does that make sense yeah and we didn't need islam's help to get to that point definitely yes yeah well what do you expect or do you have any expectations about your questions and doubts and fears in the future my because i don't think it'll go away because mo currently most of the time i'm very very like i don't pray anymore um i only pray when my parents are around um i don't make i don't do like i, I don't plan on fasting next from my dad 
but my parents are planning on taking me to Umrah, and I just feel as though, like, um, in my mind right now, I'm at peace, but that won't be for long, because my family is very religious. Like, as of right now, I'm expected to get married, like, and a lot of the people that are brought to me um, are 10 plus years my seniors, because they don't believe in, like, me marrying anybody who's young they think anyone who's like even 25 is just um how do i say this childish in a way because of this islamic belief or this um their cultural belief where like it's best for a woman to get married when she's older and uh i know i'm talking in circles but what i'm trying to say is i'm at peace in my mind but i know i won't be at peace especially with my family since like all my family has been Muslims for generations. Like I have no like non-Muslim relatives and I'm a people pleaser or I like to please my parents. So I feel as though like I've been like a disappointment my whole life. So it's like, it's a very, very tough space for me right now. I don't know what my next move would be. And I don't know what my future is looking like. I don't know if I'd ever tell them that I left the religion. And I don't know what would happen, if if that makes sense. Well, your priority should always be your well-being, right? Whether you tell them or not, you got to do whatever you got to do to survive and to have a good life. If that means right. not telling them, then so be it. If it means telling them, then that's what you need to do. In the meantime, are you able to refuse their their suggestions or their um, like candidates for marriage and all that kind of stuff, or are they pressuring you? I can refuse, but the thing is, it's like, how do I say this? They expect me to be gone before 25. And me refusing constantly is uh, is going to cause a lot of issues between me and my parents because we do like argue and we do fight. So, like, it's 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 like uh, they. I have, they give you like this illusion of an option when you really don't because if you don't accept them because everybody else in my family just accepted the person that they were given and it's like I'm the one that's giving giving them a hard time because I just I'm not attracted to these men I don't like them they're weird um but it's like well the next person that we bring you're gonna have to like be with them does that make sense they do believe in like you know me being happy or whatnot, but they also believe that they should have the right to just like, you know, like it's very confusing. Like their ideology is very, very confusing. I'll, I'll say that. It's a difficult situation to be in. And I get what you mean that um, you feel like every time you refuse your, your, doing something wrong compared to your relatives who don't refuse those kinds of arrangements? Exactly. Yeah, but just remind yourself, and we're all reminding you, you're not doing anything wrong by refusing, um, no matter how much they guilt trip you or no matter how much you might guilt trip yourself to. What matters is your well-being, and it's a a long life commitment that you don't want to get into with someone that you're not interested in. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very, very tough spot to be in. Sometimes I wish I was a man because oh, I can't do this. It's very hard to say, um, to say no, you don't want it. Like you don't want it at all. What do you think you would say to someone in a similar situation as yourself? someone who is probably listening right now, what can you tell them? What can I tell them? 
if you're in the same position as I am, if you're able to move out on your own and you have the guts <laughs> to do so, do it because that'll be your only uh, key to happiness, to be honest. And I mean, if your parents like don't like hate you, if they like, you know, they'd probably be upset for a minute, but I think that would be like your best option. Um, if you can, um, uh, but if you can't, try to refuse as much as possible and find someone that you actually like. Because I don't know that those are my best those are my best ideas. Um, if anybody's in the same like situation as me, they're they're very good suggestions and. Um... Yeah, thank you for offering them. And I hope that... Yeah, you're welcome. I really hope that your situation improves. And I, I hear some language that I know you're not intentionally using to be cruel to yourself or mean to yourself. But, you know, always remember that you aren't... Um, like you said, if, only if you have the guts. You already have the guts. You know, having this position and sticking to what you know is right, despite all the gaslighting, despite all the um, pressure, you are already very brave for doing so. So don't diminish that Thank for you. yourself. Thank yeah. you. Um, I really appreciate it. I mean, I would, but it's just that I have siblings, and I feel as though if I were to leave, like, the pressure, they don't, they, they, they don't, like, I feel like all the pressure has always been on me, so they don't know how to handle it very well. When I wash them, they can't handle it very well. So, you know, you just gotta, you just gotta do what you gotta do sometimes. And I mean, if they're okay, I'm okay. I just don't want to be, you know, cut off from them because I we all grew up in the same house. I can't, I can't just up and leave, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's, um, it's sad that you even have to figure out whether or not you would cut contact with your family or they would cut contact with you when you're not really asking for anything outrageous. But just let me remind you, if that day has to come, just remember that you are doing it for your safety and it might even empower you to someday get back in touch with them when you're in a position to help them if they're in a similar situation. So keep that in mind that maybe you can be a help to them, but not if you just stay where you are for a long time because you're afraid of losing touch with them, if that makes sense. Yes, definitely. Um, I never planned on cutting them off. I don't, maybe I'm not my mom, mm -hmm. but my dad is very, very, he's religious on us. So, yeah, like even like, like every night he wants us to read Quran and Hadith. Like that's how much he's like dedicated to the religion. Yeah, from from his point of view, it it makes sense, right? Because there's an afterlife, and there's uh, he's just preparing yep. you, you know, to not go to hell. But in the real world, it's uh, it's excessive, it's exhausting. Yes, it's, it's de it definitely is, especially yeah. watching him. The more and more, especially these past couple of weeks, uh, living them, living as a like you know secret ex Muslim, just hearing the things that he says does it, like it sounds. I don't want to call him like delusional, but it sounds delusional. So it scares me because it's like this is what a delusional person would say, and it's very sad because. He's he he has seen constant death within his life, and I I feel like doing something like that would probably like give him like a heart attack. He's already very very like a like a nervous type of person, like an anxious person. So doing something like that would probably like raise his so called blood pressure. I don't even know if that's the case with him, but he believes it. So yeah, I don't know. It it's a lot of pressure that you're putting on yourself, and I understand why, but. Just remember that whatever happens, however he reacts, if that someday comes up, 
you know, if, if it has to. It's not your fault that he's reacting that way. It's not your fault that he believes what he believes. This has been him since before you existed. Like, this is, is not something that you've done to him. Um, and you just have to remember that you can only control your own emotions and your own reactions and actions. Uh, you can't control theirs. So just don't blame yourself too much for their reaction if that day comes. Definitely. Yeah, I think I kind of mentally prepare myself for that, but we'll see how that day goes if that day ever comes. If I can uh, muster the courage to do that. Well, I hope whatever it is that you do is for your good, own good, and for your safety and your well being. And thank you. I, I know you'll figure it out. You figured out this much so far. So, <laughs> yeah, I. I'm not as um, worried about you as I'd be about someone who doesn't sound as sure of their conclusions. So I, right. I know you'll be good. Thank you. I appreciate it. Of course. And I appreciate your videos also. That was a true compliment. I've been watching you. You and, um, what is it? Friendly ex Muslim and apostate prophet. But they're also like the nicest people that I've ever like watch you guys are so sweet you guys helped me like you guys helped me with this like journey i like y'all's videos a lot thank you i'm um i'm glad that you like them i'm glad that i was able to help and yeah i, I hope that many people hear your story and feel some sense of camaraderie and that everyone Everyone listening to this, I hope that you get to a resolution just like the caller. I know the caller will. And I wish you all the best. Thank you. And I just wanted to say to like any of like the ex Muslims that are like the questioning Muslims, um, a lot of Muslims will make you feel as though you're delusional or that you don't know like what you're reading or what you're looking at. And especially like the so called progressive Muslims will like to like twist and turn the meanings to make it more modern, but what you're reading is exactly what it means. There's no, especially if it's like the terrible ones, there's no beauty to them. It's just, they're just terrible. But thank you. You have a good day. Thank you. Same to you. And uh, yeah, I hope to hear again from you someday and I hope uh, things continue to trend up. Definitely. Thank you so much. Yeah. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks again to the caller. Um, as you'll see, it, it seems to be a theme. Some comments about progressive Islam. Um, I will refrain from making any comments about that topic for today, but I will echo other people's sentiments about it. So I'll read uh, a different questioning Muslima's um, testimony, I suppose, or, or her story after a few callers. We, st we still got a bunch of people in queue. So thank you all for wanting to join. Uh, so let's see who is next. By the way, uh, sorry, some people have been seeing ads during the live stream. I don't know how that happened. I think YouTube changed a few settings recently. I'll try to see after the live stream if that can be changed because I don't want you know the live stream to be interrupted with uh, with an ad. So we've got another caller. No voice changer for that caller. Um, I hope you are ready. Caller Hiblis, <laughs> what a befitting name. Hey, can you hear me? Uh, you are muted at the moment, Hiblis. Um, hi, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, yeah. So I guess I just want to start by saying thank you for do for doing this live. So, um. Questioning Muslim, questioning Muslims have a platform to talk because I feel like the internet is just very much polarized between like very staunch Muslims and ex-Muslims and it can kind of be hard to find a place for like the rest of us to like, comfortably express our doubts. Um, but yeah, no, I guess I just, for like a, a little bit of background on myself, um, I was pretty devout Muslim for most of my life. Um, and even when I had doubts, I guess I was, I would always 
uh, deter back to the sentiment that I'm quoting loosely from the Quran, which is that when Allah and his messenger um, decide something, it's not anyone else's place to um, question that, I guess. But if, for me, like a couple of Ramadans ago, um, I just started having a lot more like theological doubts. Um, like the concept of eternal hell was like very hard for me to deal with. And then especially in tandem with the question on uh, free will and predestination, which I saw your video about that a couple of days ago, which I thought was like a really good video on that topic. Um, and yeah, so I guess at this point, I kind of just have a lot of doubts about um, like the validity of religion. And I guess on like the existence of God in general, because I think from like a philosophical point of view, you can probably make a good argument for the existence of God. But um, I know that obviously doesn't mean that like religion is true, but yeah, no, I guess it's just kind of hard for me to um, decide whether or not religion is true, if that makes sense. Um, like, especially with Islam, you know, the proofs for it are um, like literary miracles or like perfect preservation and whatnot. And I guess like, I don't, I'm not a native Arabic speaker, so like I can't really speak to whether or not the literary, literary miracle is a thing or not, or if it's just like very subjective. So yeah, I think that's kind of just what makes it harder for me to come to a conclusion and not like go back on it. It's, um, uh, let's pause there for a second and then expand on something you said last um, okay. that literary miracles so it sounds like you have questions about the validity of religion in general like you said there yeah. could be arguments made for the existence of God but about religion specifically or Islam specifically you're not finding good enough reasons to believe is that what you're saying Right. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. But um, I feel like the flip side of that is also like me struggling with finding reasons to disbelieve. Um, like, I know that this is like probably not a very popular thing to say, but I think for me, for most of, because like most of my life I've been so religious, like I kind of find it hard to feel like, okay, just because, okay, no, I don't, I want to write this right. But um, yeah, I think like, for example, one of one of like my serious moments of doubts was looking at all these hadiths about women and like women's rights and all that sort of stuff. And I remember even like distinctly at that time thinking, okay, this is like horribly misogynistic and whatnot. But like, if this religion is true, then like I can't leave it. Otherwise, I have to, you know, there's the eternal torture in hell. So I don't want to deal with that consequence. Um, but yeah, I, I guess that's kind of my standpoint, mm -hmm. or it was, anyways. And and you said that one thing that um, could have possibly offered some solace here is something like the um, miracles that Muslims point to in the Quran when they say that it's so linguistically amazing that it's miraculous. Mm -hmm. um, but as someone who doesn't speak Arabic la natively, you say that you can't verify that for yourself. So it doesn't do anything right. for you, right? Mm -hmm. um, so to think about that for a second, I mean, I... I am someone who speaks Arabic natively, and I can argue, no, it's not miraculous. But putting that point aside, if it's if it's only gatekeeping the miracle to those who understand Arabic, then is it really a miracle? Is it really a good proof? Is a miracle good proof of, of God? Um, is that something that you had pondered? Yeah, like... You know, when I say I kind of just like flip flop between it a lot, I think I definitely go through like phases of thinking, okay, like, like you said, the point that you brought up that um, it, it doesn't really count as a miracle, I guess, if only a select group of people can ever like truly attest to that. And I think I also just find myself thinking about all of these like nonsensical sort of things in religion, like, I don't really believe in miracles and um, that sort of stuff. And how it contradicts with science like evolution and whatnot um and i do like i do have those thoughts and i do like ponder on that but then i think the kind of thing that just like keeps me walking between on this fine line between like disbelief and belief is also just like the fear of hell and like the fear of being wrong um 
because like I know like especially if you talk to Muslims on the internet they will ask you like oh where you studied or where you got your credentials and whatnot and it's and, and it just sometimes feels like I don't want to like jump the gun in in a way on uh, like disbelieving and make the wrong choice I guess. Wait can we clarify that so Muslims online as you said ask you what are your credentials what where did you study Islam in what mm. context or when do they ask you that oh sorry in like in the context of like if you kind of bring up a point or you're like trying not necessarily trying to debate but like you know you're trying to bring up objections um a lot of people will just throw it in your face that like you just don't understand the basics or you don't understand Islam properly so yeah if you have objections they ask you what are where's your phd in islamic studies before you can make such right. an objection mm -hmm. right and I'm sure that people who do study Islam and have those objections will still be dismissed for another similar reason. Um, yeah, that's true. Well, does that ever, I mean, I feel like that's um, detrimental to what they're trying to do when they tell you, well, you can't, you can't object to this unless you've actually studied. Do you think that that has kept you, kept your faith, not just kept you with the label of a Muslim, but has that made you believe anymore? Mm, um, I don't know. I feel like that's kind of just like a little bit tricky for me because um, I think the one thing that kind of keeps bringing me back to faith is like this idea of fear. And like, even I can like attest to that, that it is mostly just like fear, like the uncertainty and like the fear of the unknown. Uh, but like, I guess it, that, that whole tactic, it really does work in keeping you like kind of like on edge, I guess, about um, believing otherwise you're in for a whole bunch of trouble. Mm -hmm. Well, you said that um, at some point you said, uh, or at least it used to. So what brought you to exactly where you are today with faith? What was the final straw for you that you couldn't keep flip-flopping right, anymore? Um... Or, or are you still flip-flopping? Um, I, I guess I kind of have like phases of flip flopping. Like right now, I kind of am having that. I guess because like yesterday, I was actually talking to someone online, um, and it was about like the free will and predestination thing. And um, you know, I guess again, once again, this person was kind of just telling me it's because I didn't understand it, and, or like I'm deliberately being arrogant. And, um, like my family is also very religious and although they don't really like enforce things on me, um, just constantly being in that environment of like being told to turn to God, like it kind of just like makes me feel like an outsider. And, um, I guess that's kind of also why I keep gravitating towards like religious content, but I'm sorry, that's kind of like off the top of you asking me like what kind of got me to this point. But, um, yeah, like I was saying, um, like a couple of years ago, I think for a lot of like non-Arabic speakers, uh, at one point, like the whole scientific miracles in the Quran was a pretty big thing um, because like, you know, science doesn't, isn't restricted by language. And I think for me, that was also like a really big thing. But then once I realized that I fell apart and that didn't really have any, have any merit, um, I kind of was just asking myself, like, well, why do I believe in this in the first place? And especially when you look at religion and, like, um, just the fact that in the world, most people will end up following the religion of their parents. And when you kind of look at that in combination with, like, free will and predestination, then, like, God kind of set it up that way. And so it doesn't make sense for him to punish us for something that he um, ended up creating. Yeah, that's that's one of my biggest hurdles with the religion is predestination and free will. And even if it wasn't predestined, that I can try to unpack why someone feels or thinks the way they do. But it doesn't seem like God, Allah, is actually doing the same thing. If ultimately it's believer or disbeliever, that's what matters more than their actions, their intentions, and everything else. Um, it's such a weird criteria to fixate on. And especially when, like you said, it's predestined. Yeah. So do you mm -hmm. think that then it's the social pressure that's the biggest reason why you're still on the fence? 
Um, yeah, I guess like social pressure is one of one of those things. And I think like also just the fear of hell. Like I know that um a lot of people say there's like ways to get over it and whatnot. And like I've kind of been trying, but I don't know. I guess I just keep coming back to this like sense of like uncertainty, like um that maybe I haven't just like studied enough. And I guess when you're like hearing that all the time that like oh, you just haven't, like, looked into it enough or you're deliberately, like, being stubborn and, and whatnot, it kind of just, like, eventually makes you think, like, oh, is, like, am I really being, like, deliberately stubborn or is there, like, a, a genuine reason for me feeling the way that I feel, if that makes sense. Right. That's, um, that's a tactic that we see in other high-control groups where they start to make them question their own sanity or question their own judgment rather than address mm -hmm. the actual problem. Um, so you see that tactic even in the Quran itself, like the way that mm -hmm. God allegedly would, would kind of lose his, his temper and say, well, you never believed anyway. You guys suck. You guys are not, that's because you're right. not thinking you guys don't feel you guys are this and that. Um, like if God was really trying to make a case for himself, why is he losing his temper and, and emotionally reacting to what he knows is going to happen anyway? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. It, so it's yeah. the fear that's the biggest we, aspect then, right? Like what's the biggest yeah. anchor is the fear? Yeah. No, I really do feel like it's that is kind of the biggest anchor. Um, and like I said, also just like potentially believing God or at least being agnostic about God. Um, I know a lot of people just like had to jump from the conclusion that like, oh, God must exist. So therefore this one is true. And that's like missing a lot of steps, obviously. But, um, I guess that is also kind of the thing. Like if I semi believe in God, I guess, doesn't it make sense for me to also believe in a religion? But, um, yeah, I guess it's just like a lot of questions that just lead to more questions for me. Mm-hmm. Do you think that you'll ever find the answers? Honestly, I I don't know, but um, it's like it kind of just makes me feel a little bit more anxious because of social pressure, like you were saying. Like um, also, like the other caller was saying, like the pressure to get married and whatnot. Um, my family is doing that to me as well. Like they're definitely not putting me in a position where, like, I won't be forced into a marriage, but um, like, and they do try to tell me that the clock is ticking on like on like finding a husband I guess but um yeah and like just thinking about that in relation to like being religious um I because I don't think I would want to be with someone who is religious but then I'm also just so like unsure of where I stand like by myself so it just creates a lot of uncertainty for me um but I guess I do think I would be able to at least think more clearly about all of this if I wasn't like afraid of the consequences of making the wrong choice. The real life consequences or afterlife consequences? Afterlife consequences mainly. Mm -hmm. I, um, I made a video about this talking about ways to get over the fear of hell and another video about my experience with uh, the Islamic hell. Um, and I if you do have time to give them a, a listen or a watch, maybe you'll find something that could be useful mm -hmm. in your pursuit of getting over the fear of hell. Um, mm -hmm. But it might take a while and it, some of those feelings might resurface every now and then and that's, that's natural. Um, mm -hmm. It's a lot of programming that takes a long time to, to tackle. So mm -hmm. is, is the fear of hell um, affecting your day-to-day -day life? Um, sometimes it does, um, like if I'm just busy with like work or something, then I obviously don't have the time to think about it. But like, if I have downtime then then I start thinking about it and it makes me, um, really nervous. But, um, can I actually ask you a question about something that you said a little sure. bit earlier? Yeah. Um, yeah. Like you were saying that as like an Arabic speaker, um, like the linguistic miracle of the Quran, it doesn't like, you're not convinced by it. Um, would you say that like that is that would be the case for like most people if they weren't religious if that question makes sense 
like do you think that the social pressure to believe that it's like a a linguistic miracle is kind of what makes everyone like hype it up as much i think it's um yeah i i think that most arabic speakers aren't even that well versed in arabic literature to be able to objective or not even objectively sorry that's the wrong word to be able to give you a measured answer to um, what this compares to in terms of other arabic texts and other historical works of literature in the arab world uh, myself included like i'm no expert on the arabic language mm -hmm. so most arabic speakers have no authority um or no even like um academic authority to tell you how it compares to other texts but they genuinely believe because it's always been recited and heard and said in a spe special context that it is special and mm -hmm. they've run these experiments before with native arabic speakers with uh, non-arabic speakers where they would play a, a, a recitation of the quran and their claim some apologists claim that it's so beautiful and different that even a non-Arab can spot the difference. But even Arabs fall for it. If it sounds like the Qur'an, if it's words that may have been in the Qur'an or seem like they could be, even Arabic speakers fall for that. Um, it's I could tell you with confidence that growing up, I always felt that there was something different about the way that it was being recited, the way that it was written. But there's nothing miraculous about it. In fact, even as a kid, I was able to point out some grammatical oddities not with confidence, not saying, you know, here's a mistake in the Qur'an, but actually asking my teacher, wait, I know from grammar lesson, from, you know, from Arab, this word should be pronounced differently or should be gendered differently or something like that. And they would tell me, well, that's an exception for the Qur'an or this is a rule where, you know, it's different when God does it that way or it's, a, it's used that way for emphasis. They're working backwards from the conclusion that this is perfect but it's it's absolutely not like you can if you're a native arabic speaker and you just sit down and read it you can see how scattered it can be and mm -hmm. no one has ever outlined what the criteria are for a perfect book but i would imagine that being scattered is not one of those criteria um right. yeah so i don't know if that answers your question but uh yeah yeah no that does um I've actually recently been like reading just the translation of it in English. Um, and even just like the English, it is very like scattered. I mean, it's kind of hard to follow along. Like a lot of times I find myself like referencing the series just to like kind of get the context of what is going on. And like, like you said, um, like another point that kind of just reminded me of was also just like the whole challenge of bringing something like it, um, which I've always thought is like pretty absurd just because like what there is no clear criteria laid out for what that challenge even entails but mm -hmm. yeah no i guess when you kind of break things down like that um like the strong points at least that how apologists would present them um they do kind of, you can kind of start to see the flaws in them and it's um and, and at the end of the day it, it's a it's a niche community of people that appreciate literature in that specific way so as a god as a fair god why would you hinge the proof of your existence on a niche interest or like a, a niche spe a specialization even if you can somehow um, get some specialists who say yeah i like this literature and it's perfect what does that do for humanity like that's there's a lot of other ways that god can prove that he or it exists that aren't that convoluted but um yeah i'm like to recap even most arabic speakers they just fall back on this um indoctrination that we've had that the quran has always been mm -hmm. special and always will be special and in some ways it is special but is it does that special mean that it's divine i don't see the link mm -hmm. yeah no, that's true that's a good point and the the one thing that I um and this is getting more into my belief than yours I suppose but the way that I think of the whole perfection claim is if I can make it better just one percent better then it's not perfect and mm -hmm. there are many verses as I'm sure you're aware that are kind of controversial and um, right. 
the apologist would say, well, you're misunderstanding it. And even the translator is, is misunderstanding it. Even the scholars are misunderstanding it. If I can clarify that with a few words, then I've done a better job than Allah. How's that possible? That's true. Yeah. Um, can I bring up like one other point? Um, I guess it's, it's also just like one of the things that kind of makes me doubt is um, like the whole miracle claims. Um, like for example, the whole moon splitting thing being in the Quran, like I know there's no real like scientific proof that it happened, but I don't know, I guess kind of just like the fact that it's there makes me wonder like, why would it even be in the Quran if like something didn't happen? Otherwise people would just call the prophet a liar, you know? And I, and I guess like that sort of thing is just like, it makes me wonder like, did it really happen or um, did some, or like maybe it was like an eclipse or something, but I don't know. I mean, if, if I recall correctly, um, the only mention to that event in the Quran is talking about a hypothetical as in near the day of judgment, the moon has been split or something like that. And see, it's not a perfect book. It doesn't clarify if it's talking about the present, the future, the past, the tense of the, like the grammar doesn't really say much about that. Um, but there was a hadith about Muhammad actually doing it or telling people, hey, look up, look, it's the moon splitting up. But when you ask um, the apologists, if that actually happened, why is there no signs of it on the moon? And mm -hmm. like in my generation, I remember seeing emails being passed around about how NASA found a crack on the moon that confirms the blah, 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 the splitting of the moon. And... I remember there was a blog post by some scientists at NASA specifically saying, no, that is not true. This picture is of a crack on the moon. It doesn't span the entire moon. And it doesn't mean that the moon was split. So now apologists don't actually say that NASA has proof that the moon was split, but they say that God hid the proof. Like God split the moon and then put it back without leaving any trace of that. Why? Yeah, yeah, no, that that is true. I guess that is also just like another thing that makes me like not believe is just like what is the whole point of doing all of these miracles and then leaving no proof and then just telling people who are coming thousands of years later to believe in it. Like yeah, like, I guess a lot of that logic seems pretty flawed. It it helped me to think about how in any other situation if somebody told me my friend did a magic trick but he actually hit it and we didn't get it on camera, but you have to believe me. I, I would have no reason to believe them. So mm. what's the more likely explanation that God went out of his way to hide the proof or that it just never happened that way to begin with? Right. Yeah, no, that, that does make a lot more sense. Um, but yeah, I think that was kind of, that was it for my comments. Um, thank you for your input. Um, I think that definitely kind of helps me see things a little bit more clearly. Of course, I'm happy I was able to help. And um, yeah, I hope things continue trending upwards. And I hope that you don't have that fear um, for much longer. Thank you. Yeah. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. You too. Yeah. Bye bye. Thanks again to the caller. Oh, and I forgot to mention my cat. Um, is right there, a poo. So funny story. We still have a few more callers and I think I should close the queue now. Thank you everyone for joining the queue. Um, hopefully I can get to everybody in the queue already. So yeah, funny story. A couple of days ago, my cat, he likes to jump on my shoulder when I'm sitting over here. So he'll jump on the chair and then on my shoulder, but he freaked out because he jumped and he slipped and then he scratched through my shirt and like scratched through my belly um he's such a gentle giant and a clumsy clumsy dummy so he hurt me not meaning to and then he jumped off and the shirt was ruined but thankfully it's not one of the aladdin shirts get your aladdin shirts merch today no i'm just kidding it's just a white shirt um, wouldn't that be funny though if i sold merch and it's just white shirts so that way you can wear it and no one can out you for wearing a white shirt but at the same time you'd be supporting me that's a good idea but I don't think I'm a merch kind of person. Anyway, going back to the queue, I'm getting a little bit off topic here. We still got a bunch of callers. Um, let me see. I'm adding a voice changer to some callers who have requested it, but by default, I am not doing so. So 
I believe it's only the caller in room three, sorry, in room four that needs a voice changer. So I'm adding Radine. I hope you're ready. Let's try this out. Hey, can you hear me, Radine? You are muted at the moment. Let me know when, uh, oh, uh, maybe Radine was not ready. Hmm, let's try again. Hey, Radine, can you hear me? Hey, man, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we're all good. How's it going? Sorry, man, just turning off the stream. No worries. Yeah, man, it's going good, it's going good. Um, yeah, I guess, do you want me to start talking about myself, or how do we do this? Yeah, of course, um, tell me a little bit about yourself, and what you uh, have questions about or doubts about yeah man i mean uh yeah first thanks for doing this man like uh just echoing the sentiments of the earlier callers i just felt like you know there wasn't really a place for muslims who are questioning to you know have a have a have a voice really because um as part of the Muslim community, you know, if you if you are questioning, you are an outcast. You know, it's not even a question of you being an apostate. It is very much uh, a straight line there. You know what I mean? Um, and then I found that with the ex-Muslim community, sometimes it was a little bit too overly aggressive on the other side too, um, which made it which just made, made, makes it a hard place for people like us to really have a discussion. So I found that this place is is good for this community, but. Thanks. Yeah. I'm I'm, I'm um, glad to have this space for you. And um, I, I just want to say that I was always worried about having this specific kind of live stream because I don't want to make it seem like I am luring the vulnerable Muslims into my space to like, you know, to, to change their minds. All I'm trying to do is give you a space to talk about this. And if you'd like to challenge me on something or if you'd like me to play devil's advocate, um, please let me know. Like, I just want to make sure that this is a fruitful conversation for you yeah no yeah no and i think it is you know i think um compared to some of the other channels or whatever i've seen um this has always been a place so far that's that seemed very respectful i think you're very much always reminding people not to um you know mislabel people or generalize muslims in general so i think that's that's a good place to start thank you um but if i just talk about like what my perspective is i mean growing up grew up in uh canada pretty religious family um yeah and i mean i just feel like from a very early age i always had a skeptical take on it not necessarily a rebellious take on it but a skeptical take on it i remember being like four or five years old and uh, i remember asking my older sisters like hey what happens if god's not real though you know and I remember just getting the most, whoa, you can't actually ask that question. But they themselves were also surprised that I was even asking that question, you know? And I think... Sorry, that I how old really were you when you asked that? I was like four or five. Okay, wow. And I just, I feel like I never really had a desire to, let's say, disprove or rebel against God, but I had a deep desire to, you know, understand it. Like, what is this actually coming from? Like... I don't just want to be told what God is. Like, I want to know what God is, you know? Um, and that's sort of the perspective that I always had with it. And so, of course, as you're growing up, you're going to always, uh, you know, be closest to the perspective that you were taught. So, of course, like, you know, I was raised through this Islamic lens and I did try to connect with that through, you know, my younger years and my teenage years. But I think that uh, as other callers have mentioned as well, that concept of of hell was always a thing from a very early age that made me feel like I'm I'm never gonna buy into the dogma of of this religion per se. Like I'm I, I might be able to I don't know if you would call it believe it or or see the truth in it, but that dogma part of it, like that the concept of hell in general just always never connected with my mind in any way. Um and so as I went into my teenage years, I I sort of kind of stop practicing you know um and i didn't feel so intimidated by it i wasn't so scared of the fact that i was like you know i was pretty confident in my rebellious teenage years of just like okay look i'm not um i don't need to buy into all of this you know but i always still had that desire to to understand and to know god is because i've always had this belief that something's there and so you know i went and explored all kinds of different teachings um, and then I think like maybe two, three years ago, I eventually, um, encountered some like Sufi literature 
I read like Rumi and a couple of other Sufi texts. And this finally kind of opened up this lens for me where I was able to, you know, see Islam in a new light. And that is kind of where I'm at right now. So I think we could maybe bounce back from that and then get some more insights. Sure. Well, first of all, um, I commend you at the age of four or five to ask that big what if question. What if God is not real? Um, like I was proud of myself for asking similar but not as daring questions when I was around that age. Like I remember mm -hmm. thinking of this this image of a, the globe, um, which by that point, you know, we had seen space in, in the media, so I knew what a globe looked like. And I remember thinking, what was before Earth or what was before yeah. humanity? Um, I didn't know anything about the Big Bang. I didn't know anything about the solar system, n none of those theories. It was just a question of what happened before God created us. And that question mm -hmm. was obviously answered by my family. Like, it, they, they tried to answer it by saying, well, time started with, you know, God. There was nothing before God, before us. And mm -hmm. I couldn't quite comprehend that. And it stuck in my head for a long time, but it never occurred to me to question, what if the answer they're just, they're just giving me is not true? Or what if this God theory is not true? So it's amazing that you had that what if at that young age. Um, mm -hmm. That's first of all, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, you know, with that point, like, I think that that is actually part of what reinforced, like, where I am right now, because I remember feeling so deeply connected to that question. And like you, the answers I would get from my family, whilst they would come off as confident, you know, oh, this is the answer, this is the doctrine, this is what we're taught. I always just had an inkling in my mind that, look, this person also has no idea what they're talking about that this person is speaking from something that they've um, inherited from a belief system and that like it just was never satisfying enough to me and i could tell based on the answers i was getting from people around me the adults around me it just wasn't satisfying enough for me um man and I think do, that, do like, you know how much i would milk that if 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 that was my situation as a kid and now it can come out as an apostate and be like i already knew all this stuff from when i was a kid i would flex it so hard but that rock planet, this blue rock planet that is, um, you know, filled with other kinds of creatures. And this planet is this rock that's hurling through this black vacuum of space around this ball of fire and amongst billions of other galaxies like it. And I think the more you start to just contemplate that and not just fill it with, with, with random theories, but just contemplate it, whatever, uh, the point you get to is that, look, there's there's a question mark that's left, right? Like any person, any reasonable person understands that there's a question mark. Whether it's a scientist calling it the Big Bang, whether it's a Muslim calling it Allah, whether it's, you know, Christians calling it Jesus, whatever it is, like there's a question mark on life and reality. And um, for me, the conclusion that I've come to is that question mark, that question mark whatever it is, I am really grateful to that question mark, right? Because that question mark is what allows me to exist and I love life. So that is really my my theory on God. Like the question mark is God. Does it really matter all this um, doctrine and theology we talk about? I don't really think so. I think, you know, we're here to just be grateful to that source. And I actually think that all these religions and all these traditions are essentially talking about that question mark and 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 really they're saying the exact same thing about that question mark that it exists we're here to be thankful for it and i really think that's the core message of every religion based on what i've learned and and so i think that like you know that allowed me to release some of the fear i had about like oh am i like choosing the wrong religion like by like questioning islam am i going to go to hell it allowed me to sort of see that like that is the only reality I feel like and all the religions are talking about it. And so I don't need to, you know, pigeonhole myself into this Islamic lens with all this doctrine, which has, you know, its problems as you've discussed with many of these other people. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of my perspective on Islam at this point in time. Well, it's, it's interesting to me that you say that you were here to be grateful to that source. It sounds awfully similar to what Islam says our purpose in life is, is to worship Allah. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that has influenced your conclusion that we're here to, um, or your position, that we're here to be grateful to that source of life or a source of existence? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that it might be um, it might be it might be based in that as to why I think that might be the purpose of life to be grateful. Um, now, this is where the distinction comes in, right? Being grateful to that source for existence and for life can't be equivalent to, you know, following every doctrine of Sharia and the Hadith as we know it to be today, right? Well, like, do you think that it was ever that at some point? Um, for me, you mean? Mm -hmm. I don't think so for me. Um, I think that, you know, amongst a lot of, I mean, I, I think, I think that seeing it in an Islamic frame and I do really think a lot of the parts of the religion have a lot of value and are really beautiful. Like, you know, I do think that, that praying five times a day in terms of like what you're actually trying to achieve, you know, which is essentially just to say, thank you. I think that has benefit, you know, so to do it five times a day is beneficial. You know, I think fasting, which, you know, sort of reconnects you to your body and, you know, again, generates that gratitude within you has benefit. You know what I mean? Um, so a lot of these things have, have, have benefits. It's just a question of like some of the doctrine, you know, like I, I, I think what, some of the, the ones I would like to highlight maybe would be like, this idea of of hell, first of all, right? Um, I, and I think you actually just mentioned this with the previous caller about how, like, you know, you could make the Quran one percent better, and then that would sort of make it this valuable literature as opposed to what people claim it is, which is this perfect pizza thing, right? Well, I think this whole concept of hell, right? We have these people telling people that, you know, God's going to throw you in hell for doing X, Y, Z sins, you know, and I always tell like, you know, people who I'm debating, hey, like, you know, let's say this is your sister who did X, Y, Z things that apparently you're going to go to hell for, right? I want you to get in the car right now, go drive over to the house, pick her up, put her in the trunk of that car, okay? And then go take her to your local incinerator. And the fire in this incinerator is, you know, a billion times hotter than any fire on earth. And I want you to look in her eyes and tell her, hey, I'm going to put you in this incinerator because you did X, Y, Z. And I think pretty much 100% of humans would look at me and say, hold up, I'm not doing that. I think I could have compassion for my sister because, you know, the things she did are forgivable. And so the paradox of this is that this person is essentially saying they're more compassionate than God, right? Because we know that God would throw you in hellfire for doing these things. So and and then that would actually be the biggest sin in Islam, which is shirk, right? Like you are basically saying you're more compassionate than God. You know, every single day in your prayer, you're claiming he's the most compassionate. But then in this simple thought experiment, you're showing yourself to be um, more compassionate than him, which would obviously be uh, quite blasphemous. So, I mean, it just uh, doesn't make let, sense. Let me play a devil's advocate here or apologist's advocate here. Um, okay. As a believer, I could say, well, I wouldn't do that to my loved one, but mm -hmm. if God, the ultimately just, has decided mm -hmm. that she is worthy of that punishment, even if my human empathy or ties to her or um, my weakness, if you want to call it that, stops me from um, from doing that to her, God's ultimate, ultimately just and he will do it because she deserves it. Like, what do you think of that justification? Right. Well, I think that... Um you know, I think that's a that's a decent point apologists can make that, you know, God holds the reigning view of justice and that we might not understand. Like, let's say we're talking about someone, I don't know, drinking alcohol or something, right? Maybe we just think, oh, yeah, well, whatever, this person drank and, you know, they're hung over the next day. Not a big deal. They probably shouldn't deserve it um, or burn for it. And maybe in God's view, in the ultimate uh, sense of justice, it's it's just preposterous. You know, like this person needs to burn for this. Because, I don't know, it has other effects on society or whatever greater justice you could conceive of that uh, specific situation. Yeah, but I mean, I'm specifically talking about, let's say, these more minor things, especially in the lens of Islam. Um, like, okay, fine, we're not talking about murder, we're not talking about this and that. We're talking about things that, again, like Muslims hold you very strongly to to these certain deeds that you do or don't do, you know what I mean? And that I just feel like if you zoom out, you look at the cosmos, you look at how many things are happening, 
and you're telling me God's going to get bogged down on this. It's almost as if like the, the only way that this would be worthy of the punishment of hell is if God's sense of justice was minimized, not maximized. Because if you maximized it, it just, I just feel like from any rational point of view, it just doesn't make sense. You know, um, I could probably develop that, that thought further. So it's good to have the devil's advocate to it. But I just feel like from a common sense point of view, it just doesn't make sense. You know, that's the conclusion that I've come to, at least for myself. Okay. I'm following that. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned that you've um, read um, Sufi literature, and mm -hmm. that's where you're at now. Is that what you said at the time? Yeah. Um, so I actually, I actually still pray five times a day. In fact, for my, uh, throughout my uh, teenage years, I, I didn't, you know. And then, sort of when I started having this, um, yeah, I guess like it's less harsh than Islam is. Like I do feel like Islam is a little bit more harsh than them, and that's why reading things like you know Taoism or Eastern philosophy. All right. Uh... Three, two, one. We should be back now. Okay. We should we're be good? back now. Yeah, we're good. So, sorry, okay. start from the beginning. Uh, you no were problem. talking about coming across Sufi uh, literature. Right, yeah. So, Sufi literature, I was just saying how um, how I, I actually, like, still pray five times a day. and Or not still, actually. I stopped when I was in my teenage years. And then after coming into contact with this... Um, sort of interpretation of Islam, I guess you could call it. Um, it, it sort of breathed new life into, into it for me. You know what I mean? Um, it allowed me to take the truth from the religion. And I know it might sound a bit self-centered to say that, oh, I'm the one who's privy to the truth of what this religion is actually saying. And, um, and, you know, other people or whatever, like that the more traditional Muslim wouldn't get it. You know what I mean? Um, but anyways, I'm not trying to convince anyone of my own beliefs. So, I, you know, I'm not preaching to anybody. This is just the truth that I've come to. And oh, so... I, I will like, ask you some questions about that afterwards. But yeah, Sure, sure, sure. Um, it, just, it just allowed me to, 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 to practice the religion without being so deeply attached to the dogma and doctrine behind it. Because it allowed me to see it this way. This is the way I look at it, okay? The, the way I look at it is that... Um, you know, spiritual um, enlightenment, or I guess, you know, um, I wouldn't call it enlightenment. I find that that's very narcissistic. I would say just, just the idea of like uh, spiritual fitness can be equivalent to, can be, yeah, equivalent to like regular physical fitness in the sense that you have all these different ways you can achieve physical fitness. You know, you can go lift weights, you can run, you can swim, you can do all kinds of different sports, whatever it is, at the end of the day, you qualify as fit if you do those things enough, you know, you achieve the state of fitness. And I think anybody can achieve a state of, you know, spiritual fitness, a closeness with God, a closeness to that question mark that I mentioned earlier. If they practice any of these sports or workouts or whatever, you know what I mean? And that's the way, that's my perspective on religions that, you know, every, di every all these different religions have these different kinds of practices, but most of them are centered around the same thing in the same way that, all these different sports are centered around physical activity. Most religious and spiritual practices are centered around concentration and silence. Like that is pretty much the the sum of all of them. You know, you, you you're in silence and you concentrate on something. In the case of Islam, you're mostly concentrating on the recitation. You know, but maybe sometimes you do meditation or you'll do a mantra or whatever it is. But it's that practice itself, not the dogma surrounding it, but it's that practice itself that gives you spiritual fitness. If you if you follow, and what led you to follow the that version of it that is Islamic rather than like you said other sports like other um, mm -hmm. spiritual religions? How come you chose uh, Sufi Islam? So this is the um, this is the part where I, where I would I would vouch for some of the really beautiful qualities about Islam and. I think that, um, you know, that practice of putting your head down and, you know, submitting to that larger truth that's at hand, the truth of that question mark, I think that is a very um, engaging practice for an individual to go through. You know what I mean? Um, and I also think a lot of it has to do with um, my upbringing in it. You know, like I saw my dad and I think, you know, I think my dad is less of a dogmatic um, person when it comes to religion. He's more of like... 
he has more of that heart perspective rather than that, oh, I'm going to go to, you know, speaker's corner and debate people about all these dumb rational arguments. Anyways, um, so I, I really do feel like my dad had a really honest and trying to connect with God level of perspective and and maybe just growing up seeing that made me feel connected to it in that way. And that's why it works for me. And I'm not saying it's going to work for everybody, especially if you didn't grow up outside of Islam. I feel like the the whole concept of learning all these surahs and stuff is can be a bit convoluted. But um, yeah, maybe something works for something else, uh, somebody else. But yeah, that's kind of what works works for me right now. And I think that, I don't know, I think maybe it's like the the content that I see nowadays or I don't know if like this religion and the Ummah is becoming so much more fundamentalist or polarized maybe that I, again, it's almost like I just want to practice this in my own room, in my own silence. But the more I interact with this more fundamentalist content, again, it renews this sort of like, oh man, like what are these people doing kind of vibe inside of me too, which is kind of why I'm here too. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it, it makes sense that you would reach to the uh, spiritual version of Islam rather than going to a whole new ballpark, you know, and, and starting fresh with another religion, um, especially if you can practice it with your community to some extent, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Like, and again, the community and cultural part of it is, you know, I think, um, and I don't know, I can't speak for you, maybe you feel similar ways about it, but, you know, even if you do become a full ex-Muslim and renounce the faith, like, you can't necessarily throw out the whole baby with the bathwater. You know, you can't, in the sense that, like there are parts of you that you really like maybe the parts of you that were raised islamic you want to discard now but there were parts of you that you like and so it's kind of this confusing um thing for people i feel like to you know renounce certain beliefs because it almost feels like they're throwing away their whole identity too and then it's like oh who am i now you know yeah it, um that's a very delicate and personalized um issue because not only does it have to do with your upbringing in your community and how they view their religious identity, but it also has to do with you and how much that ties into your identity or your behavior. Um, like mm-hmm. I, for example, it's it's not easy to to have that divorce from you know your Muslim identity uh, completely. But for a lot of people, including myself, it felt almost inevitable and out of my control. Like a lot of the things that never mm-hmm. fit you know I, I had questions from a very young age too and i always felt like i was out of place and i never truly in got to enjoy that that community in um like a guard down sort of way because i always felt like i was an outsider like i didn't ask yeah. the question the way you did but in my mind i was thinking what is wrong with me that mm-hmm. i even have these questions and that i don't see the answer as obviously as everyone else um and then I associate a, a lot of bad traits that I have with a lot of bad traits that I, not necessarily that, you know, Muslims around me taught me something, therefore I don't like Islam. It's more that Islam has instilled in me a certain fear or a certain habit that I don't like. So, I don't yeah, know. In, I, I totally relate. In, in the process of like trying to pick apart all the parts that are Islamic, it's you're bound to lose some some stuff in the, um, like throw the baby with the bathwater as you said it's bound to happen so it all depends on how high the stakes are do you care if that happens how much does it contribute to your happiness um and it seems like you've struck a good balance for your situation and mm-hmm. i got to say i'm a bit jealous of your approach to things and your way of processing it like to be able to find a diamond in the rough and just, you know, for the viewers here, I don't think you, for example, agree with the parts of the Quran that I would bring up and say, hey, this is horrible. You shouldn't treat your wife that way, for example. You don't really make excuses for that, but you found spiritual, I don't know, enlightenment or connection in other parts of it. Um, and I, uh, I'm i a little bit jealous of you for that. I'm glad that you're able to do that. And I generally don't really have any objections to that except when people claim that that was what God intended all along. And it's, you know, if only you gave it a shot, this is actually what Islam is. I don't think that's what you're saying, right? You're saying no, Islam you know, can be this. Yeah, I think I think it can be, you know, it's it's one avenue through it. Like, I think, and, and, and you know, I relate so much to what you're saying about feeling like an outsider and feeling like you, you know, you can't speak with your guard down because... 
the sad part about this is that, hey, look, like I'm someone who practices, you know, and I, I don't know. I, I feel like maybe I do practice more than a lot of people who it's not a comparison game anyways, but I feel like I do do practice more than, you know, a lot of these haram police in the comment sections who are ripping people apart. You know what I mean? I just have the inkling that I do. And it's sad that I, I don't feel open enough to go into a message or wherever kind of place to, to be able to have the dis kind of discussions that I'm having with you right now, where it's open, it's non-judgmental, we're working on ideas together, you know? And, um, and you said how, you know, at some point divorcing that, you know, divorcing yourself from that identity was almost inevitable. And I do agree that for a lot of people, it, it, it might even be necessary, um, because for myself, let's say one aspect that I've struggled with is, um, so a couple of years ago, um, I met, uh, the partner who I'm with right now. So my girlfriend, and obviously, you know, it doesn't, uh, need to be explained, uh, very much a taboo, uh, in the Islamic world, but even in you know, Sufi Islam, right? Like you can't really, you, yeah, exactly. From a, from a, from a very law point of view. Right. But I think that that has been an important part of my journey because it's 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 made me contend with like what do i actually believe because we're dealing with a real human here now you know and i found it really interesting the point you made about how um you know how there's parts of you that you don't that kind of were instilled in you by islam and some of that part comes out where i'm like whoa like i i feel it bubbling inside sometimes where i'm like whoa this person by no fault of their own but still in my mind is like judging them for certain aspects of this. But the main point I was going to make here is that like, look, there's people in my community who would tell me, look, what you're doing right now, every time you see this girl, um, you're committing Xena. Like every time you even like spend, you know, the very fundamentalist perspective is that even being alone with her is, is a very haram act. Um, but then it's like, I had to contend. I had to dive deeper. It actually forced me to look even deeper into the religion and then you just come to something simple like, okay, so you're telling me someone who, you know, uh, prays five times, uh, five times a day, uh, fasts, you know, does all these things to to come closer to God. I'm somehow um, supposed to just go in the trash bin. And then you just have like this whole doctrine or this whole history of Islam. And you, you have like, you know, the prophet with his child um marriage you have the prophet with his concubines you have concubinage and and sex slaves in general as being a thing so you're like oh you can't be with this girl because she's not muslim you're committing zina you're haram and then you have these people who are having non-consensual sex with slaves and and again it's one of those things where you zoom out and you really got to ask yourself is this my truth or not you know and for me it's like that that break that's another thing one of those things where i use the illustration of the whole concept of you know hell and burning your sister as an example of how you need to break out of those ways for a lot of people that would make it necessary for uh for them to divorce themselves from the identity of islam i haven't quite reached that point yet sometimes it's it's hard you know what i mean sometimes it's in waves but again i'm looking at it as like me connecting to the one inner truth that I can feel. Like, I don't know if you've read, um, like, Rumi or whatever, but um, I would highly suggest that uh, for people maybe even in the, in, in the comments who are in this, maybe if they can relate to me and my position, um, I feel like I feel like it'll ease your anxiety a little bit. But anyways, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. Well, I, um, I skipped over that step. Um, some people think that it's... Um... Not saying that that's your case, but uh, first you you know you have questions, and then you become a Quranist. Maybe you become a Sufi, and then you leave Islam eventually. Um, <laughs> some people say that. I I don't assert that that is actually the chain of events that happens with everyone. Um, but I skip the step of um, running to Sufism or Quranism as a solution to the problems that I faced. Uh, so I didn't give it much thought. So I, I gotta mm -hmm. say I haven't read it, but. If you say, like, do you think there's benefit to me in reading it if I know for a fact I'm not going to believe that it is, um, I'm not even going to hold it to the same level of spirituality and importance in my life as you are holding it, so would I still have benefit in reading it? 
I would say it depends on because I don't know how much you talk to uh, talk about your own beliefs on this live stream. I mean, I, I totally get why you wouldn't or why you would, but um, it depends on where you're at with that journey in general. You know what I mean? Like, is that something that's important to you? Are you an atheist? Are you an agnostic? You know what I mean? So, because uh, if you're just like, you know, we are just a very, if you have a very materialist perspective, you know, we are just atoms, blah, 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 then probably not. But I feel like if you're in that pool of people who are kind of curious about that question mark that I referred to earlier, then maybe I feel like it could benefit. Yeah. I mean, um, I sometimes talk about my beliefs, but most of the time I don't because uh, I don't want to make this about me. Like the, the channel is not really about me, neither are these live streams. But when relevant, I, I don't mind talking about them. Um, I, I guess I, I could find some benefit in reading it. I'll add it to the long list of things that I will get to someday. Um, but yeah, I mean, my, my position on that is I think that it's fascinating. That question mark for me is how did we as a species or as life get to this point that we're debating our purpose, that we're thinking about thoughts, that we're having this level of uh, communication? Because it's amazing that you and I, I mean, aside from the technology involved here, how far apart we are, that we're able to tell each other these very complex thoughts. And then it shapes our lives. And I think that's amazing. Um, mm -hmm. Not necessarily good amazing sometimes. Sometimes it's bad. Um, mm -hmm. But that's the big question mark. I think that from my very shallow view of spirituality, it is basically trying to understand this emergent quality that we have as conscious beings. I don't think it's actually factually documenting anything, but if people have spent many years contemplating this and experimenting with it, then, you know, it doesn't harm me to follow someone's ideas about spirituality to see if they work for me. That's, that's how I feel about it. Um, yeah. And, yeah. and I think that, that honestly, man, that's the only perspective that I can respect, which is to, to, to start at that sort of, I don't know, agnostic perspective. And for me, for me, what it is, is look, whatever that emergent thing is, right? It's, it's us, right? Like it's me and it's you, like we are that thing. So instead of like trying to hook ourselves onto these external belief systems and whatnot, and what other people are telling us, like, if I am that, like, let me use my own experience, my own existence, my own consciousness to try to understand more of it. It's like self-investigation, you know what I mean? And the truth that comes from that, I feel like is is the only real truth that you like we can actually attest to anything other than that is just it's just belief you know um well i i'm not for a lack of interest in continuing the conversation i think i have a thousand and one questions for you um yeah no problem <laughs> i'm trying to think of like i, I want to ask you if there's anything that you wanted to bring up or ask me before we end the conversation but just know that I would be happy to have you again, um, as I am with pretty much all of the callers. Uh, but there's a lot more topics that I would love to talk to you about. But I, I still want to know if there's a last thing that you wanted to ask or say, what would that be? Mm, let me see. I I don't know. I, I think that um, I, I did want to talk about this one concept of just of just comparing something. Uh, like Hinduism to Islam, but I feel like it might take a little bit longer, so we can get to get to that in another conversation. Wait, you know what? Um, I'm 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 curious about your thoughts about that because I that that is a topic that keeps coming up. Okay, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just give you the TLDR of what I've thought about it because look, these these are two religions that are pretty much on the polar opposite of the spectrum of uh, monotheism, right? Um, like the things that the Quran says about polytheists is is would. would is pretty much what Hindu Hinduism is, you know, um, and and you know how much it criticizes polytheism, right? So any normal person on a superficial level would look at these religions as being polar opposites. Um, and so if you can somehow find a middle ground in these religions, then you know you're probably making a pretty good case for the point that I was making, which is that, you know, all these things are saying the same thing. Um, and so I just looked at a simple concept, um, like you know, 
99 names of God, uh, which are 99 manifestations of God's qualities in Islam. You know, so he's one, he's one monotheistic entity, but he's manifesting in various ways, right? And then you zoom over to Hinduism on the other side of the spectrum and you've got various gods, probably more than 99, but let's just say 99, you know, who are expressing, again, if you look at the qualities that are being expressed in the 99 names, you can almost always match them up to a specific deity in the Hindu scriptures. You know, like it'll be like, oh, the just, the powerful, the the giver, the, you know, all the kinds of the other names, truth, all those things have a, a relationship to one of those deities. And then, and then the interesting thing with Hinduism is that it's all tied together by this concept called Brahman, okay, which if I, if you just give me one second, I'm just going to look up that definition for you because um, I just do want to read it because it always hits me. Sure. Um, so, yeah, Brahman is, according to Wikipedia, connotes the highest universal principle, the ultimate reality in the universe. It is the immaterial, efficient, formal, and final cause of all that exists, the pervasive, infinite, eternal truth, consciousness, and bliss, which does not change, yet is the cause of all changes. So, you know, to me, that basically just sounds like Allah. Like, <laughs> what else are we talking about? You know, get over the names, people. This is what it's saying. You know what I mean? And so you're saying everything comes from this one Brahman and all these gods or goddesses are just expressions of that one thing. To me, beyond the names and the, you know, the semantics of it, that's the same thing. <laughs> um, so... I see what you're saying. It's, um, I mean, I hear this objection a lot that uh, from from theists, especially monotheists or Muslims in this context, that how could Hinduism make sense? How could a polytheistic religion make sense if you've got more than one god? They'll be fighting and arguing and stuff. But if they're all qualities of the same unit of God, whatever that is, um, or that. I mean, these qualities in God, can't we say the same about Allah, that his qualities might be fighting with each other? Like his generosity or mercy versus his fairness. These two should be at odds all the time. But exactly. somehow, Allah makes it work. Um, exactly. You why know? can't a polytheist make it work? Or like, why can't the polytheistic gods work, work it out? Exactly. You know, and, and I'll probably, I'll just leave you with one more thing that I had written down before this is, uh, is a quote from... Uh, one of Rumi's books, and it's it says, silence is the language language of God, and all else is poor translation. So that's so powerful, especially to illustrate the idea we just talked about, because look, language, like, okay, all else is poor translation. Silence is language God, all else is poor translation. So all this man-made language and semantics we're going on about, about, oh, are we going to call it gods and goddesses? Are we going to call it Brahman, or are we going to call it Allah? Like, that's just human man-made languages. But if we look at the definitions, if we look at the meaning they're trying to actually convey, and we determine that it is, because it is actually the same thing that they're trying to convey, then we understand that that is the one truth. Like, that's the silence that is the language of God. And the poor translation is us as humans just coming up with names and arguing about it. You know, it's kind of just funny, I think, when you think about it. This is why it you know, eases some of my fears and anxieties that is common for people I feel like who are questioning Islam because it kind of just makes you smile and laugh about it at some point. It's like, okay, these people mm. are taking themselves way too seriously. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, unfortunately, I feel like Islam, at least mainstream Sufi, uh, sorry, Sunni Islam, is is geared towards liter literally understanding the Quran and the text and there's not as much room for all that kind of stuff. Like there has to be certainty, especially when the stakes are so high. Um, but th there's a question, uh, super chat. I can't highlight it on screen, unfortunately. Today that feature is broken. But thank you to the commenter. They're asking you, uh, Radin, do you have or are you planning on having a YouTube channel? I would love to listen to you more. Um, I don't know. I do. I do have a YouTube channel. Um. And I actually am, yeah, making a couple things on that as well. So I actually do plan on, uh, on, on making some content. I don't know if it's just my name, um, and then my last name. I don't know. I could drop that in the comments or something if someone wanted to see that later. Once the if, next, if you don't comes. mind that, uh, like, if you want to drop it here and and you don't mind that there's going to be that connection, um, like, is it is it doxing you if you share that or? 
I I mean, I would see. This is the thing. I would hope it's not doxing. Like the moderator was asking me if I wanted my picture of my name on it, and I was like, you know, I thought about it, but then I'm like, man, we also like as people who are having these conversations. I mean, I get caring about your safety because people can be crazy, but we also just got to normalize it too. You know, like not be scared of sharing your th your opinions. They're valid. They're real. So, yeah, yeah. I'll drop it in the comments in a bit. Okay. Uh, don't put it in the live chat. Put it in the comments under the video so that it's present for everyone to see afterwards for those okay, who cool. would like to subscribe. Uh, it's funny, just a heads up, this is how I got lured into having a YouTube channel. I was also a guest on a call. So, you know, be okay. warned. You're, you're, All right. Yeah, this is the, the start of your career, I suppose. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, All right, man. Well, I really appreciated um, the space um, to have this conversation with you. It feels, uh, I think it just feels validating uh, for everybody here. Like you can just see that in the comments. And I'm really happy that, um, you know, there's just good people here. Like <laughs> people who have been banished to hell, but they're good people. So, Well, thank you for that. Um, yeah, th this is hell. Welcome to hell. It's great here. I hope you enjoy. Um, okay, man. Yeah. Hope to see you again at some point, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Man, have a good day. Bye. Bye-bye. All right, thanks again to the caller. Um, so we still have a couple of callers and a message that I received from uh, a woman who unfortunately couldn't join us today, and I want to make sure to read that. So if I forgot to do that, please do remind me. Uh, and Binary is asking, who had invited you? It was Friendly X Muslim. I was on his uh, live streamer, his channel for a chat like this one. So, yeah, it was a good time. I wonder if I can dig that video up at some point. I, I do want to see how different I sound now after two years of doing this. <laughs> um, okay, so we've got another caller. Uh, I hope they are ready. I'm adding them now. Hey, Intimate, can you hear me? You are muted, by the way. I can hear you. Okay. Uh, your voice has been changed as per your request. Um, so tell us a little bit about you and why you're calling today. Um, it's, a, it's a very... Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I, I just don't see my sound bar on the... Oh, okay. There we go. Uh, sorry. So, uh, it's, a. Uh, so where do I begin? Sorry. I'm a little nervous. That's okay. Um, I, uh, my life story is kind of like a big, like shamble thing. So I'm going to try and give the most TLDR of it that I could give, but I feel like since I was born and, uh, I was kind of handed like the worst hand in the game of life with Islam, um, with, uh, things, with things being like, um, I'm the first generation to, uh, be raised in the U S I'm the oldest son of the first generation to be raised in the U S and not to mention, I'm the oldest son in a family that's very well known in my region of the U S and thus I always had, uh, this image to uphold when it came to Islam and uh, the teachings grew up in a private school, you know, was expected to um, be this perfect uh, Islamic child um, in a society that's so diverse and with so many different ways to uh, look at life yet somehow keep a very strong faith, which I feel a lot of people who come here can relate to that being very difficult. Um, I, uh, I started to doubt my faith very, very, very young. Um, cause I'm kind of, um, to explain, uh, in terms of being a questioning Muslim, I'm more like on the sliding scale between questioning Muslim to like agnostic to atheist all the time, which is a really hard, like battle to sort through. And, uh, it started when, uh, I know my first real instance of, uh, <clears throat> 
questioning started when I was actually in a private Muslim school and uh, we had this religion class and you know the the teacher was walking around saying what you'd expect in a in a religiosity class like you know our our religion's the truth our religion's the one our religion is um the truth and that every other religion is wrong and i just remember being the only kid to raise my hand in that class and going but what if our religion is wrong and that ended up causing me to go to the principal's office to be talked to to which i just received very circular answering of just pray and you know read quran and don't think about these kinds of things the usual circular reasoning that i feel like you get when you ask these kinds of questions and as a kid i obviously just went along with it because what choice do i have and they had told my uh my parents about my questionings which did not help um how old were my, you when that happened um it was fourth grade so i believe about nine or ten uh no i i don't remember to be honest if, okay, so somewhere around I, fourth grade, you were saying. Or... It was. It was. It was exactly fourth grade. I remember okay. all too well. Um, it's. Uh, it's uh, caused a lot of friction with me and my family for a very, very long time. Um, I had always been the one that just couldn't get behind feeling grateful to a deity that I couldn't see, hear, or create an actual attachment to based off conversation or, um, or logic and reasoning. Like, you know, it's like you meet somebody, you talk to them, you decide, Hey, this person's not really that bad. And then you develop some kind of relationship with that person, be it a, friendship or relationship, a love, a hatred, it, it all starts with interaction. I have never interacted with Allah in my life. And it's, and to say that I have, it'd be a very one-sided interaction, you know, like I talked to him, it never felt like he talked back to me. And, uh, it was difficult for a very long time to have that aspect to, to the point where I stopped praying because I felt no joy in it. I don't, I don't feel a connection to Allah when I pray. I don't feel a connection to Allah when I make dua and the connections that I do feel in the community are connections of familiarity, familiarity in which I know these people. I've known these people for a very long time. So outside of religion, I've always loved them because I knew and I grew up with them, you know, but it's, uh, it's, uh, causes you to really realize how much you lose when you start to question and forward to leave those communities behind especially because they were never my communities they were my parents communities that i ended up growing up in and thus it was all i knew for a very long time and i i feel like i am uh i feel like i'm like jumping like from one thing to another and i'm sorry i'm trying to like that's okay get to, i i am trying to bring it all together to a point um I, uh, so it can start with my parents. Like, let me explain my parents in a nutshell. 
my dad came to the U.S. when he was very young, built what he had out of nothing, as it was pretty easy. It seemed pretty easy to do that back then. You know, immigrants came here with very little in their pockets, and now uh, they um, have all this, like, virtuous and, like, lucrative stuff. And my dad happened to be among the fortunate. And, uh, and, uh, my mom got married to my dad when she was 14 in Syria. And then he, he brought her here after like making this life. Mind you, this was my dad's fourth marriage. Now the first three were not Muslim come to 16 years old and I was born. So I was born to a child mother, the oldest. And by the time that she was 20, she had four. And so as you can imagine, she did not know how to have an emotional relationship with one child in her youth, let alone with four. So my life with my mother was already super difficult because uh, she grew up in a Muslim country for most of her life. And to be taken there and be a first gen in a new country at 14 with her, with uh, my dad. And I'm not trying to say that my dad is a horrible person for what he did with my mother. And I, I'm not trying to say that my mom is a terrible person either. They both did the best they could with me growing up. I was never under provided for, but I feel like that pertains to the emotional immaturity that I faced with religion from my parents because I had ended up remembering by the age of like eight, every single time I had a conversation with my mother, 90% of my mom's conversations are God. Everything is God. Everything has to do with Allah. And because I was the oldest son, um, I had these expectations from very young because I already had three siblings by the time I was four. And, uh, that, uh, you know, you got, and my dad is very close to his immediate family and extended family. And so you have all these eyes in the family watching you all the time, watching how you act, watching how much you pray, watching how much you, uh, believe. And even then I would ask them all these questions of why things don't make sense, especially, especially on the topic of women and gay people. I, I grew up, you know, like any other Muslim kid would have grown up, um, learning how to be homophobic, learning how to be, at least in the Western view, misogynistic um i'm watching the video and you seem to be talking into the microphone and if you have i haven't been able to hear you i'm so sorry no no i haven't um, said anything you're good okay i'm just making sure it's, it's the mask yeah um okay i'm just, I'm just making sure i don't want to like sure. overtake anything no you're good um to one of the comments in the chat i have one half sibling and uh and uh so uh where, where was I? Um, I threw myself up. Oh, family, extended family, societal, um, homophobia, and misogyny. Um, so, <clears throat> my... It's like, as soon as I started to change my views, my entire family attacked me, asking me where this all came from, because I used to be so... I used to be a true believer. And what that equals to is I used to be super homophobic and super misogynistic to Western women and stuff like that. And when that comes up now, 
I just think about how when I was young, my, it was my parents who taught me how to be like this. It was the school that I grew up in that taught me how to be like that, taught me how to hate the LGBT and taught me how to hate people that dare show that they're different. And sorry, I'm getting emotional. And all of it's, it's radically different now because, uh, my best friends are all LGBT people who came out to me first of all people. They came out to me first when they knew how I used to be. And, uh, and, and that was what caused me to want to change. And for the longest time, I thought I had. Um, I thought that that caused me to care more about uh, people who are different, who that it's okay to be different, that I don't have to think of. I don't have to watch my friends suffer in hell because they're gay or dress a little less modestly than one of the culture would like and stuff like that. And I guess I decided to jump on here because recently I found myself relapsing on those thoughts, especially when I'm around my family. I guess I've been confusing how I miss the connection I used to have with my family. <laughs> and my mind is mistaking that for a want to revert back to the religion, even though I know that there are so many things that don't make sense. I know that there are so many things in the religion that just hurt people and that like my own romantic partner is non-binary and I start, I've started to resent them for that, even though it makes no sense that I resent them for that. And it's a very, it's a very confusing life to be brought up in one of, one of cultural enmeshment, one of, uh, one of pain, one of an inability to focus on who I am anymore because I, I don't know who I am. Outside of that religion, because I was still somewhat involved by being involved with my family. Now, recently, and uh, and it's hard to shake off what it's hard to shake off what you were taught for years upon years upon years to the point of I was clinically diagnosed with OCD. And scrupulosity has now become one of my biggest themes. No matter how much I know, no matter how much I know that things don't make sense, that I don't, it's no matter how much I know that things don't make sense, no matter how much I look up the evidence, no matter how much I look to... the actual facts of it, that real Islam is not good for people. And I will always have these doubts in the back of my mind. And 
my family already knows about my romantic partner. They know about all my friends. And it hurts because they treat me nice. But I know that I can never bring my romantic partner around them. And anytime I express my doubts or concerns, I will always be met with, oh, you never thought like that before. This is all coming out of nowhere. This isn't you. You are, you're making this all up. And not to mention, like, like any other Middle Eastern Muslim, I went through a ton of um, emotional and physical abuse. Um, my dad, and not to make the LGBT thing the main focus of my, uh, of what I'm saying, and I'm sorry to the chat, like I said, I'm very all over the place. I, to be honest, I, I found out about you yesterday like your channel and stuff like that and happened to see that you were doing this live and I, I I ended up jumping in here without really any forward script that I could uh come in with. Um I, um I remember my my sophomore year of high school somebody had hacked in to my my facebook and this mind you this is a facebook that has all my family all my close and and uh distant relatives who i don't even really know i just added them because they're family and that was a big thing in my family family's family blah 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 family 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 when I, in reality, I don't care much about these distant people who I've never be met before. Um, but somebody had hacked into my Facebook and posted to my very, very Muslim family to see that I personally am coming out of the closet and that I don't care what my family thinks and too many girls have broken my heart. They wrote this huge status in my stead that i did not even know about because i was in school when it happened so imagine how i felt when my father had called me and asked me where i was and i said school and he goes are you sure and i'm like yes why and he goes i'm at the office you need to come outside right now and he and i go out there i have no idea what the fuck is going on and he sorry if you don't sorry about the swearing if you i don't know if you're feel free um, like just be yourself yeah i don't know what the fuck is going on and i go to my dad and he's like i'm we're sitting in the car there's silence for two minutes and he goes do you have something to tell me and i'm like no and he goes, are you sure? And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, then what is this? And he shows me the status. And I tell him firmly that that's not me. And he goes, are you sure? And I'm like, it's not me. And the thing that hurts the most about that is that if I was sick, if I was emotionally doing unwell if anything other were to have happened my dad could not be bothered to leave work to go pick me up but it's just for the fact that his oldest son could have been gay that he drove from whatever he was doing, whatever job he was on, to confront me about it. And that was one of the moments that I knew that somewhere, somewhere down the line, 
this was going to be something that drew a great divide between me and my family. That somewhere down the line, it was going to drive us apart. And I'm at that point right now, you know, I, uh, I don't live with my family anymore. I haven't for, uh, about a year, but they still find ways to talk religious to me all the time, whenever they text me, whenever they call me. Cause I still try to, I still try my best with them. Right. And I, every time I try to put my foot in the door with them to have a good emotional relationship, it's a give an inch, take a mile situation and in terms of in terms of image and stuff like that if it wasn't about his image in the community would he have done what he did you know would he and with uh And the thing about my father now, nowadays, I'm, I'm 25. My father two years ago was, uh, diagnosed with, uh, cancer two years ago. And I obviously love my father. I feel for my father, but this was around the time that my romantic relationship with my current partner had started and he had the, he had, sorry, I, I, I still get very angry when I remember this, the nerve for lack for, for the nicest word that I could put it to tell me that my, my distance from the religion and my relationship and all these views that he can't get behind are making his cancer worse. The sole reason his cancer is getting worse was me. And he told me this. And I will never forget that because even now he's, he's been weaponizing it against me because even recently he Every time I come over to check on him, because I care, I love my father. I want, I want him to be okay. But lately, every time he goes, promise me that you'll believe before I go so I can see you in paradise. And if that is not weaponizing illness to the fullest degree, <laughs> And I don't know what is because it's become, it's become, uh, it's become this constant push and pull with trying to live my life morally, actually showing everybody showing everybody genuine love. It doesn't matter who it is, if they're gay, straight, trans, uh, black, white, Christian, Arab, Muslim. I, I try so hard to live to that moral. 
then it comes to what I hear other guests have talked about when they jump on here with you. That big gaping hole that you feel that that guilt that you feel trying to step away and I still have not rebuilt myself this morning I could not get out of bed till about one in the afternoon I have not rebuilt myself because I still feel that immense anxiety with my current situations can i gently disagree with that that you have not rebuilt yourself um i mean you're here telling me about all of this and i'm sorry i haven't said anything earlier because i didn't want to interrupt you and i didn't want to interrupt your chain of thought um i i don't think you're giving yourself enough credit I mean, what do you think the first step of rebuilding yourself would be? I I don't know, because I had thought that I had fixed myself. I I thought I thought because for because there was another period where I had felt like this, that I couldn't get out of bed, I couldn't eat, that I couldn't sleep. I thought that I should just throw everything away and just do what my family says again because my life was quote unquote easier then. But I didn't give in to that and I I worked to rebuild myself. I I was able to ignore the thoughts, I was able to live my life again, but then suddenly something snapped and I'm I feel like I'm back to feeling as helpless as I was when I first started feeling like this and i i hate it because those those same questions and doubts that i had back then are still there like why if 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 this merciful this merciful god this loving god this all-knowing they say all these things about this god but the one that will always fuck with my brain is all knowing. That is the one trait that they speak about this God that I will always, that will always ruin me. It means he knew that someday I would be here. It means he knew I would have these doubts. It means he knew that someday I would be sitting here talking to you. It means he knew all of this. And so no matter how much I would have wanted to change, and believe me, just like everybody else in my position, I wanted to change. I wanted to be closer. I prayed to try and feel what my family felt. But if he knew, then what's the, what was the point of ever trying to put that effort in in the first place if he knew that I would still end up here someday? If he knew that I would be where I am now? It's... It's, they say we have free will, that there's no, what's the word? There's no compulsion in religion. Is that, is that the phrase? Mm -hmm. There's no, like Rahafiddin, there's no compulsion in religion. Yeah, yeah ex exactly. And it's, if, if that's true, then why has deciding to turn away caused me the most emotional and at times the anxiety gets so bad, like physical pain in my heart, in my chest, in everything. It, 
and even the most recent conversation with my mother she goes don't worry i know you're gonna come back anyway because god said it himself when you put it into the young for a long time no matter how much they try to stray they will always return and she tells me this and all i can think is well, no fucking shit. If I'm a kid being impressioned, especially with how much I got hit, especially with how much I got scolded, especially with how much, how much the, the fear of hell was put into my brain for this long, then no shit. I'm going to have the worst time of my life trying to rewire my brain and fix what essentially they broke uh that that they would rather choose to say that it's my my My, oh, sorry. Uh, that it's my need for for God that caused me to be where I am now, and that you're having withdrawal from religion. That it's because you're straight, right? That's what they're saying. I, that's exactly it. And even in the last one, they go. Like, in, in that same conversation that I had with, uh, with, uh, can you, can you give me, sorry, can you give me one second? Sorry. Sure. I'm seeing a lot of comments that I, I wish I could highlight, but today I can't, but there's a lot of supportive comments for the callers, uh, for the, for the caller today. Um, yeah, just cut me off whenever you're back. I'll just talk for a little bit. Uh, sorry, are you, are you, sorry, I just, I sorry, I, I just stepped away for a second. Um, no um, um. So, like I was saying in that same uh, conversation with uh, with my uh, mother, she again would bring up the the quote unquote asked me. The one that used to be the one that used to be you know hateful in a to for lack of better words that used to look at these kinds of things and you know be like ugh but the, uh the past you who was dogmatic about his views the yeah exactly but again, all I could think is, who did I learn that from? I that wasn't something naturally acquired, you know. It's uh, nurture. It's nurture, and all I can ever think about is if they if they wanted that perfect person that they expected me to be growing up as i feel like the first mistake they made was raising me here in the u.s where i have been surrounded by so many different um so many different uh people so many different uh so many different kinds of views and well, they you, you got to take some credit for that yourself because for some people it helps to have that kind of exposure for others it actually solidifies their bigotry against other people and their feeling of otherness so you got to take some credit for seeing through that i mean 
that exposure could have acted like like a vaccine, you know? Like, there are people who, if they get exposed to others at a young age and they know how to deal with it, with indoctrination, they are immune to that kind of empathy. But you somehow found it in you. So I hope you give yourself credit for that. Yeah, I'm, I, I try to. I, I very much try to in the way that uh, it's... Uh, Caused because now I sit here and like I said with uh, the whole OCD thing I have these thoughts that I wish I didn't have like what if I am wrong what if I'm in denial what if I what if I screw everything up because I've been doing the wrong thing for so long even though the path that I want to walk is a path of love, peace, and respect. And how could that life that I want to live be so bad to this supposedly loving God, to this supposedly understanding person? And with the concepts of like, you know, Jannah and Jahannam. Even then, it's like, the more you read into both, the more that those quote unquote final destinations don't make sense either. Because you're supposed to be happy in Jannah. But how can I be happy in Jannah knowing that my friends who aren't believers or of LGBT or of atheism are not going to be there. How am I going to be happy if I know that they're down under? And the only answer that I could come up with for that is because once you're there, you're essentially just as brainwashed there as you are on earth more actually more 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 because negative emotions are erased so you're telling me i have to go through all this for my negative emotions to be erased my negative and in fact i'm supposed to feel happy that the people that i've grown to love will not be there with me. I mean, to, to take it a step further, if you were to believe what's written in the Quran, you would even have petty, you know, back and forths with people who are being tortured while you're in heaven. You would be taunting them and telling them, you know, who's laughing now? That That is a negative emotion. We're taught that you don't have any negative emotions in heaven, but that is one, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's like you have to you have to it's it's scary to think that the you that the you that you are now the you that you've worked all your life to build is not going to be the you there and it's so so what are we striving for in that case? Why are we striving to get to a final destination in a sense where you won't even recognize yourself? Having an, I, I don't recognize myself right now, and it's the most agonizing thing in life. So why would I want to go through that again? The un the old me being gone. Granted, best life. You're always, you're always uh, changing, and uh, you're always becoming something else. But every time that I've 
become a new version of myself, the process would absolutely be agonizing because you lose an old bit of you. Negative or positive, losing a part of you that you've known for a long time is painful. And so if the fact that God apparently can make that a painless process going into Jenna, but refuses to make that kind of process for people painless now, it's like, what's the point? I don't want it. It's brainwashing. It's, 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 it makes zero sense. And if anything, it makes me fear Jannah more than I could ever fear Jahannam. It, it makes me fear that even if I see my family there, it is my family that caused me so much grief in my life. And then once I get to Jannah, I'm going to have to feel happy that the memories of what they've done to me in my life are just going to wash away and that I'm just going to be happy there. But that phrase, that those things that my father said to me even recently are just going to wipe away. It's like, I may have forgiven it now, but I will never forget it. It will never be something I'll ever look at him and positively reflect on. And it sounds like when I get the Jenna, someone's going to bring up that story and we're just going to laugh about it. It makes me so angry to think about it makes me angrier to think about that does it give you relief to think about how that most likely if not certainly will not happen i i wish i could say it did and the only reason the only reason it doesn't is because of how badly pulled apart my mind has become. And as again, with the, with my diagnosis and stuff like that, the thoughts, the questions, they never go away. This is my reality for the rest of my life. I'm always going to be sliding scaled. I'm always going to be questioning. I'm always going to be, I'm always going to have to grieve an old way of thinking. Why do you think it's and a life sentence? It's, that's just this mental disorder. They don't, uh, the thing about uh, OCD is that it doesn't go away. It, it sits with you. You only ever learn to cope with it. So, excuse me for this question next, because I am not a mental health professional, and this uh, I'm not suggesting that this is true. But could it be possible that... Yes, you do have that diagnosis because of the indoctrination, because of the religion, because of your experiences and traumatic experiences, but you don't have it for the same underlying um, physiological, biological reasons as someone else who might have it just, uh, you know, from birth. Is it possible that it's triggered by you know, n nurture rather than nature, and that makes it somewhat reversible? I don't know the answer to that one. I can only say that I've 
experienced the symptoms that most have experienced and that even by nurture it's something that can develop even later in life and once it develops once it develops it's hard to say you know well i I feel a lot of what you feel um i've went through some of what you went through not all of it and i haven't had a formal diagnosis but sometimes i feel the same way you're describing how you feel um and, and i'm wondering for myself too you know if I, again i'm not i'm not saying that we have we're in the same situation but i noticed that i have had improvements in the way that i think in the repetitiveness of the way that i think in this back and forth and this um you you mentioned the name of a symptom that i didn't even know was named that uh, scrupulosity scrupulosity uh, yeah that's um it's uh so with ocd there's uh different themes right there's different fixations different obsessions uh scrupulosity just happens to be one of the themes that one can get fixated on which i feel like is a very common one for the religious and even the non-religious um it's uh I, I struggle with other symptoms like relationship OCD, um, sexual orientation OCD, but the ones that have been the most uh, prominent have been uh, have been uh, religious. And uh, to the commenters, to one of the commenters, I have to. I have to address right away. No, OCD is not just checking locked doors. OCD is not just washing hands and keeping things tidy. It's not a quirk. It is absolutely not a quirk. And it's not something that can just go away like that so i would appreciate no i i don't think anyone was uh, was trying to minimize it and i I advise you to just don't pay attention to the comments for now um don't worry yeah um yeah that's just something where it's like that's misinformation that we can't have spread you know yeah no i'm 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 not i'm sure people are, are telling them that that is not the case um i just want to say that it may seem very bleak at the moment and it may seem inevitable and a life sentence and it, it might be some of the mechanisms that you're describing might always be with you but there is hope for improvement there is hope for getting rid of some of the triggers at least that keep putting you back in these in these cycles um, and getting you stuck and yeah. there might even be some ways that you can make it work to your advantage not to say that it's uh you know a gift it's more of a curse than a gift for sure but there are ways to still enjoy this life without erasing who you are without being a new person um it's just you'll have to find solid ways to not flip-flop because that must be very exhausting and and i understand why that happens you know and then you described earlier your affinity for your family and your feelings for your family and confusing that for confusion about the religion. Uh, that, that is, that is hard. It's like, I, I will always want to be, I will always want to be close to them. I will always, even now as my dad's, slowly deteriorating i will always want a relationship with him which was which i should have realized from a young age that's the thing i i felt 
that's another thing. I, I feel like from a young age, I always knew that my life was going to turn out like this. That That's like, called anxiety, isn't it? Like, I mean, you're maybe you're working backwards from just general anxiety that bad things are going to happen. And when bad things do happen, you think, I predicted this. I should have done things differently to avoid this. But that's just anxiety. You can't do things to avoid everything. Um, you couldn't have seen this coming. Like the way that you just said it, I should have known this from a young age that I want a relationship with him. There's nothing you could have done differently. And that's not how we view time. That's not how we live our life. There's no going back to change things. Things happen the way they did. And you're not at fault for that. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's just really hard. And I, I, I guess I just want people to know that, uh, if they feel like me, then it was, it's a very, what's the, where am I getting at? If you come from a, especially like a first or second gen U.S. Muslim family, we, you grew up, growing up right now, I grew up in a time where everything that I was taught was wrong has become so normalized nowadays, right? And due to the fact that it's become normalized, it forced me to look at it and ask myself, well, why is it so bad? And once that questioning starts, it's really, really hard to stop it. And... You're not alone if you've gone through gone through the same thing that if you struggle with the fact that you were taught something was wrong for so long and now it's just so normal nowadays that you had to really look into it and just could not find the answers for why it was wrong that they expect that were expected to have. It's, That's, yeah. it's hard. It's, it's very hard when I, it was, it was not as hard for my parents because they grew up in a country where everyone thought relatively identically. There wasn't room for questioning. There wasn't room for doubt. There wasn't a, <laughs> there was a mosque on every single corner. So if you ever doubted, you just popped in. You like, I've been to Syria. That was my, that was, that's my country of origin. I've been to Syria. I know for a fact that there's a mosque on every corner. You could hear the Aden from any bedroom as you're going to sleep. I remember that too well. And when I remember that, I still try to give grace to why my parents are the way they are. Because the way that, you know, like Christianity is normalized in America, it was the opposite in countries like Syria. You know, like it's heavily influenced. It was on every corner. It was on every wall. It was, it was everywhere. It really and, sounds to me like you and I relate to that personally, you've thought it through very deeply. Like, for example, you don't have a short-sighted view of your parents thinking, you know, black and white, they suck. My dad is a horrible person. No, you understand what got them to that position. And that is great. And for a lot of people, that is the first step towards a path of um, healing. 
But for some people, like maybe like yourself, maybe like me, it almost like shortcuts us to a position where we think we have all the facts, we think we still can't find a resolution despite knowing all the facts, and then you might get stuck. Like you might have your own blind spots despite the overthinking, despite the obsessive thinking. You might have your own blind spots about you know, your thoughts, yourself, your morality. And um, it's a blessing and a curse, right? Like it sounds like you've thought everything through, so you're very nuanced about it. But at the same time, some humans enjoy just, you know, I'm angry at my dad and he sucks and then they move on with their life. But you're not able to do that, right? I'll never be able to do that. I, it's, yes, you, you don't pick your family as they say. It's like a RNG kind of thing. And I think when you find yourself in the midst of your mental, you, I think being put in that mental position really, really causes you to look at your own triggers per se, and then kind of, whether you want to or not, related to uh, everybody else ever. And the thing is, this isn't my first time trying to be open about who I am. And that's the whole reason I had a voice changer. I admitted to my parents these things. I've admitted to my parents that um, I don't think I believe what they believe. And that just ended up being so negative, like the results, that uh, I just didn't want anyone watching, potentially watching this, who might recognize me due to the descriptions of my situation, to put me through that all over again. And it, uh, it's hard. It's very hard. It's do you ever because, feel like um, because you've thought everything through and you have a higher awareness of this whole situation than them, that you owe it to them to handle this on everyone's behalf? Well, in a sense, since I was a kid, I was always expected to handle everything on everyone's behalf as, as an oldest son of said community. And, and it's always going to travel with me where I'm always going to feel the need to be a fixer. If it's broken, I need to fix it because my parents won't, my siblings won't. It has to be me. Why? Because I'm the oldest boy. And that's just always how it's been. Which even then, I look at my father. My father has helped all his siblings build stable lives here in the U.S. But the thing, the thing about that... that that makes me laugh is that my father himself isn't the oldest sibling. He just ended up being the most successful sibling. And with that, he took it upon himself. But you, you are taking it upon yourself because of being the oldest sibling and always being the fixer. You're, you're still feeling that way now. Especially that you know more about the reality of Islam and why they're believers and why you're a believer than they do, right? Yeah, it's like I have to, I'm always going to want them to 
live their life. But they have. As... No, I mean... what, what I mean is like what I mean is like live their life um, without worries because I've seen them go through the same worries that I have. And even then, and even now, when I try, because, you know, aside from my immediate family, people like my cousins and aunts and uncles, they, you know, they treat me good to my face. I'll leave it to my mother to say things like, do you think that they're not talking about you behind your back for what you're doing and stuff like that? And she said stuff like that to me before, like, you know, do, it's like, yes, they're being nice to you now, but do you know what they say behind your back and stuff like that? They say that you're lost. They say that you're, they, they say this, this and that. And why can't you be like this cousin? He buys his, he buys his mom diamond rings and doesn't even make uh, that much money. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm not hearing. Like, I'm not hearing any reasons why you should be fixing everyone's problems. I, I don't. That's I mean, the thing. I, like, here's what I'm trying to communicate to you, because sometimes I feel like when you're stuck in that position, when you're stuck in your own cycles of thoughts, you might not see it objectively or even from an outsider's point of view, like even when you're giving it your best to keep the peace, to, you know, be the fixer, to um, do it their way so that they're not anxious or they don't have people say things behind their back so they're not distressed in any way, you're still not giving them what they want, which is a good Muslim son. And you can never give them that. So why yeah. do you keep trying to do the next best thing? Because it's not doing it for you and it's not doing it for them. It's because of what I was taught. You know, that, uh, that uh, because I am the oldest and because I didn't take over everything my dad built and because I didn't uh, take into my hands everything that my dad decided to take in. It doesn't sound like you did anything you, wrong in anything that you just described here. I know realistically it shouldn't be. But there's going to be a part of me that always feels like I am a disappointment and you know in the realist nature of things i am i know definitely that uh i'm going to be someone that's considered a disappointment that i'm going to can be considered you know lost or for the more literal sense i know i'm going to be to that family How as do you long know as that? i am boy. what you said to the family but is that all that matters in life, what the those specific people think of you? When it's been hammered into your brain for so long, it's hard to say no. I'd, I'd like to say no. I'd like to say it doesn't matter. You know, I really would. Oh, can I... Like, can I put myself in your shoes for a second? Because um, in many ways I can. So let's presume I am the one who's telling you all this. Um, you've only come across my channel yesterday. You don't know what my videos are like. You, you don't really know me. But do you think that I am a failure of a person? No. Why not? Because you're simply a person doing his best to find the meaning in the life that he is living. Well, I'm, I'm glad you think so, but if I were to go by what, by what I think, 
and but by what you know let's just say people in my life would think they would probably come to the same conclusion you had about yourself which is i'm just inevitably destined to be a failure by those standards can you try to do that exercise where you put someone else in your shoes and think what do you think of their life do you think they're a failure i know it's not easy to undo your whole life thinking from your family's point of view but you might have more empathy and compassion for other people than you do for yourself i mean let me ask you this why did your friends come out to you um you said you were a muslim at the time when they came out to you i uh <laughs> i i say i was i was still like uh i was still questioning i was still always questioning and even by then i was someone who told myself that i hate the sin not the sinner uh, which i feel like is such a bull bullshit statement like hate hate is hate and so uh why did they come to you then given that you're at that point at least visibly outwardly sort of a muslim i i don't know if you were to speculate i mean i'm sure you know a lot of muslims that they would not have come out to right that those same friends probably wouldn't go to that person and and share such a secret so why you and not those other believers saw something in me that there's couldn't i mean i don't think they were thinking about assessing if there's good in you or if you're a good person or not they were probably thinking is this going to turn out to be a good interaction for me is this person going to be kind to me and they they guessed yes before they even told you about it there must be some reason for that like if you were a failure of a person why would they share such an intimate secret with you like you succeeded at making them feel comfortable despite your title which would make you implicitly hateful and i'm sorry to any muslims out there but if you say i'm a muslim a lot of gay people implicitly think oh so you're probably homophobic against me despite that you succeeded at making them feel comfortable i can i can confirm that statement when one of my during one of my jobs um that i worked at at the time um i walked in and months later um my assistant manager who was of lgbt walked up and he was like hey uh blah 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 could uh could i uh could i admit something to you i almost said my name but <laughs> i uh could i could i admit something to you and i was like yeah what's going on and he goes when you first uh when you first got hired i thought you were going to be homophobic and i was like oh why is that and he goes because i heard you were muslim so it's it's very true that uh those words give a that title gives a very and and don't almost. don't stray off of the compliment here because i know you might be sort of doing that despite you having a label like thank you for sharing the anecdote first of all i'm, I'm not trying to be mean here um yeah, no, you're good. despite you having that label that repels people you know from feeling safe from you know that that kind of person from feeling safe around you um, those friends did feel safe around you and you managed to make them feel safe without really breaking you know the, the, like you had so much constraints to work with your religious indoctrination your beliefs your fear of hell and despite all that you succeeded at making them feel safe uh, you don't consider that a huge win i'd say that i considered it a win for so long and i will continue to try my best to stay on that path a lot of my distress has kind of just been coming from 
be relapsing in those thoughts of potentially being wrong. And it does, it does hurt to deal with. Like, I'll never look at those times and think of them as anything other than wins, you know? I'll never look back at that time and think of them anything as other as good moments that I've shared with people who are dear to me. And I, I've tried to, and that's what I ended up trying to embody. I've tried to embody that in my username alone, intimate, because what that's, that was something that I've lacked growing up was intimacy. And what that means is open nurture and happiness because intimacy isn't just romantic, you know, it's shared love and experiences with people who you truly enjoy each other's company, regardless of the basis of those outside factors like religion, race, the like. It, so yes, I will always strive to live up to that name. To live no, up to no, that I, word. Let me, let me no. rephrase that for you for a second. Sorry. You're saying I will strive to live up to that name. It sounds like another task that you have to do or some more work that you got to put in. You're already living up to that name. Like you're viewing it from the position of obligation and, and duty and work rather than I do strive to be that person. I am that person. I want to be happy about being that person. And correct me if I'm wrong, like maybe I'm, I'm you know, just gra grasping at straws here, but I relate. Yeah, I, I don't think you're grasping at straws at all. I, there's always going to be like, a, I feel like there's always going to be a little thing in the back of my mind that will always wonder why I'm doing it because that's just always been there. Um, but as long as I keep doing it, you know, then like, it's kind of just like, because I, I know what it's like to not feel intimacy, to not feel safe, to not feel, uh, not feel able to confide in others that I promised myself that I swore to myself that someone will always have someone to confide in, in me. And it took a few tries to learn how to be that thing that I wanted to have, to be that, uh, listening ear. Hey, you know, you're, you said you're around the age of 25. Some people are thrice your age and they haven't figured that out. So even your phrasing of it took a few tries, it almost sounds like there's a, a bit of criticism there that I didn't figure out soon enough. It took me a few tries, but it's the opposite. It took you not that many tries. Like... I, especially now as I get older, I, the thing that I think about the most is I, I used to want to be a father or not that was just influenced or, or like genuinely me is still up for debate because, you know, in the cultures that we grew up in, the, the, uh, the equation was, uh, go to school get a job, get married and have kids. That was the, that was the equation. That was the, uh, that was the recipe. Uh, don't stray from the recipe. 
but uh, as I look at uh, it now, I'm kind of just like, the world's kind of weird right now, and like, it's kind of awful. <laughs> The world's kind of awful as it is right now that uh if i were to have a kid i, I feel like i wouldn't know how to protect them and so like i really think about it i'm like do i want that kind of responsibility but for the longest time um i thought what if my own kids were gay what if my own kids decided that they didn't believe what if my own kids had the experiences that I had. Would I, A, be the same as my own father? Which I know the results because I'm living them. Or B, would I want to be the most open, caring, and loving father that will respect their kid regardless and so that was kind of like a drive for a long time and it's still a drive and it's so whether i have kids or not that's something i feel like people really need to think about it's that people need to think that if i were to talk to my own child the way that my parents talk to me would I truly be happy with myself that I couldn't, that I didn't support them in the way that potentially could have helped the relationships drastically? Well, I, I could tell you that one of the reasons why you probably have so much empathy and compassion for people is because as you have identified it's something you were lacking before so you had to provide that for yourself and other people but beware that you're not just giving it all out to other people and not yourself because that tends to be overlooked and that's probably happening in your case right it mainly happens when it mainly happens because I've taught myself to feel like I don't deserve it. Mm -hmm. You know, my, again, my parents are victims of their own circumstances, but since young age, since a young age, you know, I've been called, I've been called stupid. I've been called, uh, I've been called, uh, Magdub. I've been called, uh, Dub. I want, like all those things, those common, those common Arab things, and but, and it feels so normal when you're in the middle of it growing up, right? But you kind of realize how it affects you later. All the insults, all the uh, the physical <laughs> abuse that you've gone through, like especially in school, like you know, they. Culturally, they want you to have the best, and if it's not, like, it, uh, it'll always feel like it's not enough because, like, I could get a B on a test in school, and I will always remember my mother going, but it could have been an A. Or, like, I'd show my parents, or I'd show my parents something I'm excited about. And they'll be like, okay, that's cool. But how's school going? That That's or, probably how you think of yourself too. Like, yeah, sure. I was a safe space for those friends who came out to me, but how's my family life going? But how's everything else? I don't have everything under control, so I must be a failure. And that's, uh, that's, that goes back to why I say sometimes I just feel like I don't deserve it because it feels like I was conditioned to feel that uh, but if it's can not I, the best. I want to let you in on a realization here. Um, this conversation would not have happened 50 years ago, right? Like you would have been going through this in your own part of the world 
I wouldn't know about it. However many people wouldn't be watching it at the same time. And you would not have figured out at the age of 25 all of these things that you're self-aware about. You probably would just perpetuate it onto the next generation. Um, so you think that it's such an inevitability and such a like a position that you're stuck in and, and a failure. It's actually a huge success. The level of awareness that you have like, sure, that awareness can can lull you into a sense of hopelessness, but it isn't. Like, you're, like, not to, to minimize your struggles, but you're only 25 and you've made more progress than people a few generations back have made in their entire lifetimes. It's not as hopeless as you might feel it is. Yeah. I, uh... Yeah, I feel like I uh, totally uh, strayed away the whole like topic of questioning and stuff like that, and I'm sorry. And uh, that's okay. It's all part of uh, your story and why you're questioning and why you're continuing to question. Like you're not continuing yeah. to question because you have um, valid, difficult questions per se. It's more that the fear is pushing you to continue to question. It's, uh, it all adds up to, uh, it all adds up to me looking into what true love, compassion, and peace was. And for the longest time, just like anybody here, we were told that Islam was that. We then must have look... understood love that way. That that's what peace is. Peace is, you know, things are going well for now, but could go wrong at any minute. That's what we believed peace was. Yeah, we believed, we were taught to believe that look to the Lord, look to the book, and everything would be better. But then it sucks that when you actually do that and actually go, hey, but this doesn't make sense. It throws everything around. Oh, and and I mean, uh, the ultimate anxiety here is, you know, I'm sure you've heard the phrase, pray this prayer as if it's your last. And this idea that the day of judgment is coming any day now, like even at their most peaceful, a believer believes that at any moment something terrible might happen. Like if that, that's the definition of anxiety. That's Islam's best offer for peace is things are okay for now, but they will go bad very soon. Yeah, it's, uh, it's very, it's a very, uh, fear ridden thing. And I guess that's what made me question a lot. It's just that why does fear have to push people's lives why we have to fear for a world that we don't know about it's like like my mom and dad always say that they know it's right they know it's right no no they don't no one knows and i think that's there the questions will always come from for people it's that nobody knows but we want to know and yeah, it's tough. Do you feel better now after having this conversation than you did before? Yeah, it's always helps to look. It's always helpful to be surrounded by like-minded individuals. I always, I always call, uh, I always say I like being surrounded by LMIs, like-minded individuals, because it gives you a way to not only talk things out, and I know that if I can, I, it's like I talked a lot, like I said, but if it helps anybody recognize those patterns in themselves to be able to walk 
away, not necessarily walk away, um, but uh, to be able to change their view a lot easier than I could. Then uh, it's like you say, you know, I could call that a wind. Helping yeah, I, I can tell you, I mean, not just focusing on other people doing it a lot easier. Some people might be unable to do it at all because of you talking about it. And I'm, I'm glad that that happened. I'm glad that you were able to share what's on your mind. And I hope that, uh, I hope that this would serve as some kind of a checkpoint, like in a video game where, sure, you might lose progress and you might go back to a checkpoint, but at least you can start from here every time rather than going back further. And you've already been doing that. You know, you say, I've, I've done this before. I've been, you know, stuck in bed before. But you're not going back to square one. You're stopping at checkpoints. I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure, I, I mean, I didn't want to say a lot and derail you from sharing, and I also didn't want to always interrupt you and be like, you know, I feel for you, I, I've been there, um, but I hope you realize that I do feel for you and I, I empathize a lot, and not just because I've experienced some of this stuff myself, and I really appreciate you um, finding the stream yesterday and and joining today i'm glad that that happened uh thank you for uh allowing me to uh speak and to try to find that sense of comfort and relation through you like i like i said i only found you and uh your content uh yesterday but it's you are helping out a lot of people, including myself. And uh, I uh, thank you for letting me be a part of that. Thank you for your kind words. I'm, I'm happy to hear that. And uh, yeah, I hope things trend upwards. I hope that um, I hope that I hear from you again, but I might not. And I'm just going to assume that you are figuring things out and you do believe in yourself as much as we believe in you. Um, yeah, but I do hope to hear from you again. Thank you very much. And thank you for your time. Of course. Have a good day. You as well. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks again to the caller. Um, we do have another caller in queue that I had, um, promised to to join this live stream and I don't mind going for another call. Um, there were other callers who tried to join but have been uh, waiting for so long that they couldn't. I will try to make this possibly more frequently, um, maybe a weekly thing, because it seems like there's a, a huge demand for this kind of space specifically. Um, what do you think? Let me know in the live chat. Would you rather that I just have general call-in live streams or have them topical like this, you know, for specific kinds of callers. I like, what I like about this format is it makes everyone feel at ease with the sort of conversation they're about to be having rather than jumping all over the place talking to, you know, talking to a Christian about something and then talking to a Muslim about something else. And then, so tell me what you think in the live chat. Um, thank you again to Intimate for intimately sharing their story. We all appreciate it a lot. Okay, I hope the next caller is ready. S, uh, I'm adding you now. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, right. how's it going? Hey, wait, sorry, because I was watching the YouTube live, and then... That's wait, okay. Wait, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, okay, cool, awesome. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for waiting this long. No, thank you. Um, yeah, so, um, I guess, wait, I don't even know how to start, really. I'll just give you a little sort of, like, how did I end up here, really? Um, I would say it was about, I think, like, October last year. 
I started to sort of like because I I was I used to be really practicing and then after a series of like adverse events I stopped for four years and then like last October I don't know what happened I just sort of started to think about my mortality and then after and so then I was like oh well let me get back into looking into religion again because you know like most people like most of the callers they've um you know everyone's got that fear of like what happens next so I started to get into it and yeah you were the first ex-muslim content creator that I found myself sort of like stumbling into and you know if I asked myself like maybe like if I went if if my younger self saw me now and they saw that I was like looking at any content like this they wouldn't believe it uh so yeah weirdly I've ended up here and when I'd watch a lot of your stuff you were posing a lot of questions that I questions that I also had that I thought was quite uncanny that there was just more than I guess myself asking the same questions and then in a sense it was like I would just watch one video of yours and then another and then another and all of a sudden I've like stumbled into the ex-Muslim subreddit because I was in the progressive Muslim subreddit and you know things that you'd hear about the ex-Muslim subreddit it'd be like oh it's just such a toxic space and even when you hear about Muslims talk about ex-Muslims like they you know it's always the same like they've all been emotionally abused that's why they left Islam this this and this but then when I was in there and the more time I spent in there the more I started to see actually most of the people in that subreddit are people who actually really looked into Islam so like when I would hear things like from Muslims being like oh, how many rakas in with the I actually find it really cringy to be honest because you can tell that actually most Muslims don't know their religion and for them to so yeah so here I am basically um in this weird limbo and like most of the people on this call who have been like there isn't a space for us yeah I definitely felt that so yeah basically that's just how that's just where I'm where I'm at now with all of this but what I will say is this when I was in the whole you know trying to get back into religion again and trying to look into it I think it was the worst I've ever felt in my life um and I think that says something and I think particularly for a woman like the Muslim woman experience I think is quite distinct in that way because it's not just being a Muslim that has its unique challenges it's also I think just being a woman in that space as well so yeah it's, I don't know I just that's that's where I found myself now um but I've had, I've I've come up with quite a few observations actually things that have helped me kind of like get out of the bubble of I guess Muslims and Islam in a sense um for instance one one thing I've thought about cuz if you think about it actually the the more that the internet's been a thing or it's progressed the more that a lot of us have sort of come out of the bubble that we've been brought up in and we're seeing different ways of being and different ways of existing and different religions and different religious people and like for instance one of the questions that I have is well you know particularly growing up as a Muslim you're sort of told oh God only listens to your prayers because you're the right way the way that you live is the right way but I've got like Christian friends and you know agnostic friends and and they all have sort of like their own connection to God and they're very genuine when they say oh yeah God's really helped me here and I think so are they like hallucinating or are they just imagining a relationship with God or not and I've even heard like for instance Muslim friends say to me oh you have to get an invitation to the Kaaba like to go to Hajj and Umrah 
But when I'm in the um, ex Muslim subreddit, I'm just seeing loads of ex Muslims who are like in Mecca doing Hajj or Umrah because they're forced to go. Then it's like, so why would God invite them? So there's just so many things that I'm like, do you know what I mean? It's sort of like so many lies or misconceptions, you know, and like loads of, you know, um, you know, people saying all the scientific miracles have fallen apart. Just so all of these, you know, fake hadiths that have been, you know, passed on, like the story of um, the prophet and the Jewish woman who threw rubbish, that was a lie. Like in the end, you get to a place where you're like, if there's so many lies and the trust continues to break, like how can you fix that? Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And particularly as a Muslim woman, um, if Islam, which for most people comes from the mouths of Muslim men, and a lot of them, especially the ones that I guess I have experienced and a lot of the Muslim women I know and their experiences with Muslim men have been just in positions of like abuse of power. If Islam is coming from them and that's broken, then how can you fix that really? Because, you know, as much as, because you've, you've said this before, where you've said that, you know, Muslims are better than Islam. I think they're both as synonymous with each other and they both can't exist without each other. I think they both feed into each other. They have this like symbiotic relationship and a lot of the atrocities that exist have been carried out by Muslim humans, even if you criticise the system itself, if you get what I mean. So sometimes like it makes me uncomfortable as if they get a free pass for like some of the horrible things that they've done. And then another thought that I am, another thought I've been sitting on is, you know, when it comes to like all the rules and regulations, especially when it comes to policing women, people say, oh, it's all about securing the family unit because the family unit is important. But actually, I think it's not the family itself that's important. It's the family as a vehicle for the ideology. Because if family was important, parents wouldn't disown their kids and brothers wouldn't murder their sisters and the way that you know a lot of people have expressed in these streams and in the subreddits and all the other forums of family have disowned their family counterparts because they don't adhere to you know the way that they believe is correct that's not placing families important and so in the end ultimately like I've come to this sort of like I don't know, thought, which is, you know, when people are so easy to dispose of other human beings because they share a different way of thinking or feeling or behaving, it's because it's an existential threat and you as the person who is not adhering to, you know, the other person's way of life, you are essentially redundant and that's why it's easy to, like, dispose of you. So yeah, these are all sort of the things that I've been sitting on really and still really don't know where I find myself, but yeah, that's basically, yeah. You said, um, you said something in the beginning about how getting back into the religion or trying to get back felt bad and that's a bad sign. Mm. What motivated you to get back to the religion and what felt bad about, like, was, I was listening the entire time, so to to paraphrase what you're saying, are you saying that what felt bad is all these realizations as you tried to be more religious? Just how it made me feel about myself being a woman. You know, just the whole, because essentially, like, I think a lot of Muslim women can relate to this when I say that, um, There's so much that pits us against ourselves and makes us seem that just our very existence is um, a problem. And so, you know, the the Islam that I was brought up in is one of self-hatred as a woman. And so if that's the only Islam I've known and then I came out and I got back into it, I'm, I'm resuming that. There is no 
other version I know that, you know, makes me feel better about myself as a woman. Have you sought out? uh, Sorry, go ahead. Like I could talk about all the hadiths and everything that sort of like, do you know what I mean? Well, have you sought out the um, people who say that Islam isn't that demeaning to women and that, you know, all these conclusions are wrong. Have you came across those opinions and what do you think of them? Yeah, you hear you hear them a lot. And uh, this is another thing, I think especially if you've been brought up religious without any critical thinking skills, and especially if, you know, the moment you're sort of like, oh, well, um, you know, God is hard to comprehend, then all of a sudden, like, anything can go, really. Um, it's very easy to sort of like anyone can put forward an interpretation of something or class something as something else and um, you just sort of like how can you challenge it especially if you don't have critical thinking skills so people can come with really convincing ways of trying to you know their own comprehension of you know problematic hadiths or you know that Islam is a feminist religion or Prof. Muhammad was the first feminist and all that. Um, but like most Muslims, you're not really taught to sort of like, they, they're sort of like, how do I explain it? There's, there's a level where you're brought up as a Muslim, but that's as far as you're allowed to go. You can't go any deeper. Don't ask questions. Don't even like try to challenge things. So you're sort of like stuck in this place where you are a Muslim, but you don't really know why. And you don't really know. Do you, do you know what I mean? So it's sort of like a lot of the time it's very easy to be fed something and to just accept it as like, oh, that's reasonable. Do you know what I mean? So when people come and they say, oh, Islam's not abusive to women or um, this, this and this, they'll come up with a legitimate or what seems like quite a legitimate rationale and it's kind of hard to challenge it, but that's because you lack critical thinking skills or the ability to even argue it, especially if, Every time you did try to do that, you were sort of browbeat into don't even dare question or challenge or anything like that. So there's hang-ups there when it comes to pushing back against people's views when it comes to, you know, Islam and things like that, if that makes sense. Yeah. So it, it was not a viable solution for you when you're trying to get more faith to follow that version of it. No, because, you know, there were even times where I was thinking, is the only way to be a practicing Muslim means that I have to accept that, like, I'm, you know, a non-person or, do you know what I mean? Especially when it's existential where you're, like, you're told. Because this is another thing that you that, that was on my mind. You find Muslim men love to tell Muslim women how, you know, I'll just sacrifice things especially when they're being abused especially when you know when islam's being weaponized against them you'll get muslim men saying oh just just you know have patience and you're going to get it all in the afterlife um but they're very you know this 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 life is nothing you know the next life is is the real one and you know all the suffering that you've experienced you're going to get your your payment for it when you die and all that but these Muslim men really do take this life seriously, especially when they violate the rules, they violate the women in their lives. They, Do you know what I mean? I mean, this life is serious enough for them to get everything they want at the expense, but it's women that have to sacrifice what they want so that they get the afterlife. Do you, get, do you know what I mean? Yeah, it feels like men can have it both ways. I mean... Ideally, men wouldn't sin in any way, but even um, we're not just talking about men who do things that Islam clearly says don't. There are things that aren't considered sins that are harmful to women and, you know, not harmful to men. Mm -hmm. So whether it's through sinning or whether it's through following the religion down to a T, men can get away with things and maybe repent mm-hmm. for them later or, you know, uh, have a chance to change their their behavior and then get the same in the afterlife. But a woman yeah. is, like, canceled the moment that she steps out of the, um, I don't know, the, the, the instructions for how a woman should behave. 
and she doesn't even get to, um, like you, you see it a lot. You see down women who come out and say, I used to do drugs. I used to have sex. I used to party. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and look at me. I'm such a great person now. Um, a woman yeah. can never do that. Imagine a woman saying, I had sex with so many men, a Muslim woman. Um, and mm. it, it, you can't even imagine that scenario because the amount of shame that everyone would project onto her, uh, she wouldn't be allowed to give such a speech. And mm. there's a sense of like, hide hide all of these shameful things unless you're a man who's bragging about it or about how you've overcome them. But if you're a woman, that's bringing shame to yourself, to your family, to your men in your life so yeah yeah well my theory on all of that comes down to one thing and it might sound like i'm simplifying everything is i think it's just about controlling the reproductive devices of women to ensure the survival of the group because interestingly i live in an area where a lot of hasidic jewish uh, people live and i've been watching them go about themselves i've actually watched a couple of documentaries about as the Hasidic Jewish community and um, one of the, the Jews in the documentary said that the Hasidic Jewish community is a response to the Holocaust as in they never wanted to ever have to experience something like that again that they closed themselves off so much to protect themselves like the more you close yourself off the more you're able to control um, in a sense things and therefore you know have a higher chance of survival so, I mean, and they have really strict rules, very strict rules. They've got their own, like, sort of court system, their own police, their own, you know, and they're very tight knit community. Like, you know, um, they all sort of survive off of each other. Um, women end up having loads of children. Um, and yeah, they just sort of got very strict dress code. Just the way they conduct their lives is very sort of like controlled in a way, but it really is a survival mechanism. And I just found that really transferable to the Muslim community, especially the way they police women um, with the whole making them cover up and, um, you know, um, just the way that they are very quick to police women. And especially, and I think the thing that got me thinking about this most is the way that Muslim women are in the community in Islam are not allowed to marry non-Muslims, but Muslim men are allowed to marry non-Muslim women and when I'd hear the justifications for it all I just thought it was a load of bullshit to be honest um, because you know they'll say oh um, because the children take after the religion of the father well that's not necessarily true in the west I mean we don't even need to look past our own houses to see case studies of how that that's not true so let's take that they say oh men are the providers of women I'm sorry but most of the women that I know and all that they know are the ones that are providing for themselves. A lot of Muslim women I know are just married to bums who do not provide or protect or do any of that. So let us take that out the window. And they come up with all these reasons that don't make sense. And then you realize if you control the reproductive device of women, they give birth to your children and therefore you get to ensure that the group continues to grow and survive. Because why else would you only um, keep the pool of women to yourselves? you know um and so i just see that transferred in so many different groups of people and i think that was one of the biggest things that started getting me questioning everything you know i'm looking at this on an existential level now where it's sort of like the bubbles kind of burst and i'm seeing that the way that a lot of the muslim community behaves is pretty similar to a lot of religions and what their aims are and what they try to do and when I see the the misplaced morality, especially when it comes to how they are so quick to get onto women and control and suffocate them, I just can't help but think it's that. Because if a woman thinks for herself, if she controls her own sexuality, then she's going to decide whether she has children or not, or who she has children with. And God forbid if she doesn't have children with a Muslim, that means that she's just basically redundant because there's an even higher chance that her children probably might not be Muslim. So, yeah, I just, that, and I can't get rid of that thought in my head about that's what maybe this is all about. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and I it's can't tell you, I can't tell you for a fact if this is what all of this was designed to be about, like it was some kind of grand scheme to control women's uh, ovaries, but 
it certainly has worked out that way, whether it was by design or a product of circumstances. Um, but I, I see it, I see the way that you're describing it. And I just want to make that clarification because some people might take that hypothesis and think, so are you claiming that Muhammad sat down and wrote down how he's going to control all the women in the world? No, but it worked out that way, that this is what the system what if operates. Continuation. Mm -hmm. Be what if it's beyond religious systems and it's like, you know, people might say an evolutionary thing? Because I was also reading that book, Homo Sapiens, by this, um, I can't pronounce his name, nor do I remember it. But there was an interesting thing that he'd written in it, which was talking about how what made Homo sapiens um, go to the top of the hierarchy when it came to, you know, um, all the animals in the world. And it was through their language, their ability to communicate with each other in the most intricate ways. But actually, he had this thing called gossip theory, which was basically that because we all gossip with each other about, you know, who's sleeping with who, who's a cheat, who's a bad person, uh, who's got this relationship issue with this person, um, we were able to survive as a group more because we could form bigger groups. And when you form bigger groups, you have a higher chance of survival. Um, and they, that his, what he was saying is that's where religion came from. It was this sense of everyone having this shared idea about um things so therefore if if more people had this collective idea about something that they were unified on then that ensured their ability to survive more than like for instance smaller groups um which i thought was an interesting theory this whole sense of gossip is what's kept us all alive and at the top um, but this whole surviving as a group and that that then ties into this whole, you know, why are they obsessed with conversions? Why is it about keeping Muslim women in the pool? Why is it that they can also marry non-Muslim women? Why is it about just continuing to have children? Even if you're poor, God's going to provide for you. Do you know what I mean? Just all of that is just all adding up into this, you know, I have a lot of questions, a lot of, I think a lot. I th every day I just keep thinking about all these things and especially with the whole what I was saying earlier about the whole family thing where they say the family unit is the most important it's not about members of the family are important in a sense that you know we love each other we put each other first we take care of each other it's the family is a vehicle it's a host and if you don't play your part in that you're redundant and that's why they're able to, because that's quite an animalistic thing. I also saw a video actually, which ties into this as well. Do you, did you know that bees, um, when a queen bee can't have children anymore, all the male bees flock around her into a ball. They flap their wings to generate heat so that they basically suffocate her because she just is redundant. Her purpose, she ceases to have a purpose anymore. Um, I saw a video of it and this woman was trying to basically like save this queen bee and put her in a new home. And I just thought, wow, like that's really animalistic. And that just made me think about all of the people who think it's okay to kill apostates. Do you know what I mean? And people in their families who are just no longer subscribed to their way of being, you basically become redundant to them. Mm -hmm. It's... um. It's it's an existential threat in a sense yeah. because it's like it's like a worker bee that is no longer functioning and also takes up resources. But in the case mm. of an ex-Muslim or a non-believer, you might also risk, or you will absolutely risk, th spreading these ideas. Yes. So it's it's like cutting off a, a limb that's infected is how they yeah. might see it. Yeah, exactly. And that's quite an animalistic way to be. That's not a human way to be. So when people operate in that realm, they're just be being animals, really. And this isn't me trying to dehumanize human beings. I'm just describing what their behavior is. That's animal behavior. You know? Well, um, I why just do you think never we're... Understood 
do you think that we're inher- we're better than animals or we should be? Yes, I do. I think the very fact that we have a consciousness means that we can choose we can choose how we treat people and living sentient things and to choose how an animal will choose uh, you're not operating at the you know the what you, what you what you could be which is what makes humans different I mean that's what I think you have the capability to be more because you have a consciousness you don't have to be like an animal and that's what, what would always like annoy me when I hear people say oh well, you know it's you know we're animals like especially when it comes to people um behaving in certain ways where they're like oh we're, we're animals at the end of the day we can't control ourselves and I'm like but no I think human beings we have more capabilities to choose so even though you know, we can behave like animals, we don't have to. And it's just hard for me to accept that as a choice that people make, especially like things like killing people because they don't believe in what you believe in because you see them as an existential threat. The fact that you're not aware of what you're feeling and why that makes you feel type of way and uncomfortable and you're willing to kill someone over that, I can't understand that. Mm-hmm. So I, when I hear these stories, and especially in the ex-Muslim subreddit, it's all a lot of people and their parents, what their parents are like and what their families have done to them and all that. Sometimes I want to say to them, like I don't know if this is a bit of an extreme statement to say, but you need to look at them as animals really. Um, just like they don't see you, just like they've dehumanized you by thinking that you are nothing you know even if it might be hard i would i would look at them in that way like I mean, for instance I, if i, I had I, sorry yeah go sorry. ahead tell me the instance before i tell you what i think yeah like if i had family who dehumanized me and treated me like an animal i would look at them in the same way like i would maybe i would like cut my feelings for them and i would just look at them as an animal because they're behaving like one uh, I I think there's a there's a better way to address that or think about that. If you actually think of them as human and you understand or try to understand why humans behave that way. I mean humans are animals at the end of the day. So why they behave in a way that you might call animalistic, it's part of what makes us human, you know, like you were talking mm-hmm. about that book um part of the evolutionary traits that you know perpetuated religion that's partly because we're animals. So if you mm. look at them with more like compassion and understanding, and I'm not, I'm not saying like turn the other cheek, you know, if your parents are cruel to you, then just accept it. But if you understand the factors or the, the reason that they're behaving that way, or if you try to, or at least acknowledge that there could be reasons beyond just that they are bad, um, it might help you move on from having negative emotions towards them. And it's, it might be a better approach than just thinking of them the way they think of you. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's not to say just take hard, it, though. but, you know, like, don't be complacent yeah. about it, but also don't think the same way about it because you won't get anywhere with that. You're not going to move on. You're not going to heal. And it might help you separate from them, uh, but you can still separate from them if necessary while seeing them as just humans who are a product of life. Mm. I think it's just pat- it's particularly hard for the the ones like for instance the children whose parents are really abusive it's hard to rise above that and have compassion for that mm-hmm. um, because it stunts you as a person it stunts your ability to partake in society it stunts your ability to to um, go after opportunities for yourself um, you are carrying that you, you become a type of person because of that you know type of abuse and it's hard to have compassion towards that you know um i think only after many years where you don't where you have enough distance can you try and objectively look at like the situation with your parents and why they might have disowned you or um maybe attempted to honor kill you maybe you can have the distance will allow you to but it's 
it's near impossible when you still live there or you're still living in that kind of environment to have that level of compassion for people who are willing to see your life as redundant and dispose of you accordingly, you know. It's a luxury to be able to um, have enough distance to look at your parents in a way and maybe pity the decisions they've made, you know. And I think a lot of people, especially in that subreddit, they 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 can't afford that. I look at some of the stories in there and I just think, I mean, I've I've had my own my own experiences with my parents, but I look at some of their stories and I don't know how they. I really don't know how they continue to live in it. They're like how how I just look at look at some of the lives in in the way that they describe my kids. I just don't know how it's possible. How can they? How can that be their life? You know, it's really sad. I just well, yeah. do you ever feel like you could do something about it? It's hard. I think it's even harder for 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 girls caught up in that situation. And that's when you look at life and you're like, some of us really won the lottery with um, how much more secure our environments are compared to others. It's really hard. Um, I do, you know, you, I do well enough to rescue a lot of them, but it's really hard. Well, you can't rescue everyone, but uh, I'll tell you what helped me because I felt some of that same guilt and privilege feeling like I I'm so lucky to have the space to be able to process this. Um, just promise me that if someday you're able to contribute to help at least one of those people, and I'm not saying like take on their entire case and like bring them over to your house. I'm saying to contribute to whatever extent you can to just making one person's life better, you will feel better and you won't feel like it's so powerless and they're so powerless and it's so hopeless. I'm sure that if not now, then someday you'll be able to contribute. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, realistically, there are more Muslims in stable situations than ex-Muslims or Muslims who are, you know, in a rocky situation. Um, so if every one of the Muslims or ex-Muslims or whoever is watching is able to contribute just a little bit, we have more than enough numbers to help everyone who's in need. But of course, it's not that simple. Of course, there's backlash. Of course, it's, you know, more difficult for women. But things are changing. And if you're able to contribute, even from the sidelines, even from far away, please do someday and just feel like that is you using your so-called privilege to make the world a better place. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um. Yeah, that's just really what I wanted to share. I, didn't, I wasn't going to stay too long on this call. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm glad that um, I was able to take your call. I'm sorry that you had to wait so long, but I'm glad no, that no. you joined. Yeah, thank you for the space. And I think it would be good to have... I think I think Muslims in this position who are questioning because... It really is seems like quite irrational from an outsider looking in, especially when someone has all these questions. It's like, well, it's a no-brainer. You should just leave. It's not that simple as everyone's already discussed, but there, I think that there needs to be a space for Muslims to be able to, you know, share their thoughts and ask these things. And um, I think it's really good that you you made that. So thank you and thanks i hope there'll be another one because i imagine there'll be a lot more who need that you know i um i i feel like i i might have to do this even more regularly just for questioning muslims based on the reaction that i received this time um so yeah i'll try to do this even more often and i'm glad that i'm glad that you're able to uh use the space the way that I intended it to be used. And uh, yeah, I hope to hear from you again. And yeah, I hope that things continue to trend upwards in your life. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Aladdin, for your content. It's great. Thanks. And I hope you have a great rest of your night or day. Yeah, thank you. All right, take care. Bye. You too. Bye. Bye-bye. Um,
I have a few thoughts before we end. Um, I'm not going to read that message that I was sent uh, right now because I think it will take a while and I want to put it a bit earlier in the live stream. So I will do that uh, next week. I'll have another one of these next week. So first of all, I wanted to mention the caller was talking about, um, for example, one space where ex-Muslims have congregated to some extent is the subreddit r slash ex-Muslim. And a lot of times you read stories on there of things that are happening to Muslims or ex-Muslims. And a lot of the stories are distressing. And I remember having this thought in the back of my head in the beginning of my realization of what an ex-Muslim is, that what if some of these are manufactured to make Islam or Muslims look bad? And that's an accusation that we hear very often uh, from a lot of Muslims. And sometimes it does happen to be the case that someone is pretending to be ex-Muslim to give you know, merit to their criticism of Islam and turns out they're actually some other kind of theist. And I, like, I want to tell you before anyone else, we loathe those people. They're hijacking our cause, our voices, and usually they're doing it for the benefit of their religion or whatever other petty reason. They're not even pretending to be us to give us a voice. They're hijacking our voice. So we don't like them. But the point that I was getting at is even with my indoctrination thinking, could some of these stories be fake? I realized most of them can't be. Like there's no way that all of these are manufactured. But then when you listen to these stories, I've been doing this for a long time, but it just dawned on me. When you actually hear people's voices, whether they're using a voice changer or not, when you hear the tone of their voice, when you hear the delivery, when you hear all the different ways that they're expressing their different thoughts about this, and you hear how common it is, it feels real, a lot more real than text. And I, I feel for the people who grew up just a generation ago who didn't even have that option of typing out in a text form. But even those, it, it, it may have felt cathartic, but it's nice to hear people actually talking about these stories. And maybe that'll get a lot of believers to realize this isn't some kind of targeted attack against Islam. This is a retelling of reality. This is what's actually happening. And most of the time, Muslims want to keep it quiet because either because it's a shame to the family that it's happening in or it's you know it's seen as normal like the family gets to decide what happens in their own household or because it looks bad on believers or whatever other reason it's not uncommon to bury all these stories but now we're actually getting to hear those people telling those stories and related to that there's a few comments um i haven't I haven't been able to highlight them, but there's a few comments from a person saying, I speak Arabic. I grew up around Arabs. They all seem well to do. Um, I don't buy into the women callers about how bad Islam was on them. This is not the first time that I've had women callers, Muslim or ex-Muslim, talk about the reality of Islam towards women, not just what they read, but what they lived, not just the majority interpretations of the Quran and the Hadith, but their own lives in their households. So, and, and part of the methodology that this commenter is saying, I am Arab, I lived in the U.S., and I have met a lot of American women, American Muslim women, and they don't seem to be oppressed. Do you not understand that the bias is in the method that you're collecting your data here? You're saying, I am basing my opinion on Islam and Muslim women based on all the women who I was allowed to interact with who felt safe enough to talk to me about things, who definitely aren't going to start telling you all their issues with Islam to some stranger. And all the women who can't tell you because they're having issues with Islam, you're not going to meet them. <laughs> like, how do you not see that that's a flaw with the way that you're collecting your data here, anecdotal data, which is all the women I met were fine. Well, how would you know if they weren't? And how would you meet the women who aren't fine with this? This is a platform where, from all over the world, men and women call and tell us those stories. And it's baffling to me that someone can hear them all being said and still say, this person's lying. 
Like, how could I coordinate such a well-thought-out, well-worded, um, varied assortment of callers for hours now just to make up stuff about how bad, how badly Islam has affected their lives? What do you think? Like, like let's follow that thought to its conclusion. You say they're exaggerating, and I'm not talking to this commenter specifically, but just any person who's really doubting the authenticity of these stories. So how could these stories have come to be? How is it that we're hearing them today? Is it that I paid off all these people to come and tell fake stories? Or is it that um, they all somehow started exaggerating things about Islam without any incentive, financial incentive? Um, like, what is the, 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 what is the mechanism here? But the reality is, these are real stories, the, these are real people, and I'm thankful to every single one of them for having the strength and the patience and the eloquence and the time and the trust to talk today. And yeah, I'm, I'm glad that this live stream went very well. I wish all the callers, all the viewers, and everyone um, everything good. I, I, I'm sorry, I'm losing my vocabulary now. It's been quite a long stream. Um, yeah, I'm very thankful that this is possible. I'm thankful to be in the middle of it, to be able to participate in it. And I couldn't do any of that without all of you, all of the supporters, everyone who has ever watched, commented, um, joined my Patreon, YouTube membership, all that stuff. It's because of you that I'm here today, and I cannot uh, emphasize this enough. This is because people got together and they want to see change. I'm only here, I'm only able to do this every Wednesday and other days because of these supporters. And I wouldn't be here without them. And I'm thankful to them and I'm thankful to all of you. And that being said, as always, think critically and think for 